something tells me that this is going to be a phenomenal Truck Show podcast episode. You know why, Holman? Why is that, Because we have an author on the show. We have an author on the show every week, Lightning. We do? Who? You? Uh, me. No, you're you're like a, well, I guess you technically are an author, but you're like, you're doing short form. This is long form. This is an entire book. Listen, if you put all of my thousand plus stories I've written over time together, it uh-huh. would also create many, many books. I suppose so. Jim Pickering is the author of Chevy GMC Trucks 1967 to 72 and GMC Trucks 1973 to 87. And these are perfect bound, full blown, these are the like books that legitimate you legitimate books. Yeah, you get from like Barnes and Noble or something like that when you're going to pick up your OVR mag and you go to the book oh, section. Nice plug. Thank you. And you go to the uh, book section and you do how do I build or modify a Chevy truck? Boom, there you go. And this is like the official guide. That's if right. you don't know where to start on building your dream truck, this is the book. If you've ever grabbed one of those books and wondered, hey, I want to know uh, what's the expertise behind the guy that authored this, or why are they the expert? Well, we're going to have Jim on uh, this episode to tell us what it's like to uh, write a book on how to modify vehicles. And I'm going to need your help. Okay. Uh, not you, the listeners. Ah. Well, some of your help. Maybe you can weigh in. Now I... that I'm thinking about it, I do want your help. All right. All right. Right after the intro, I'm going to ask for your assistance on choosing something that I need. All right. Well, before we get into that, we have to thank Nissan, our presenting sponsor. Man, we've had a lot of big news in the last week behind the scenes. We just added our friends at Amsoil, who are supporting the Truck Show podcast, Mm -hmm. and we just renewed Nissan for a whole year as our presenting sponsor. So that means- Oh, 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 I have something for you. Okay. All right. So that means that uh, the Truck Show podcast will continue for at least another year. Thank you, Nissan. All right. Let me show you- I'm going to start out with my favorite one first, right? Hold on. Uh It's this one. Bunch of t-shirts right here. I got Amsoil t-shirts. Do you mind if I open this? Um, You're already doing it? No, I'm going to open this so you can see it. Look at this one right here. All right. It's a Brad Lovell shirt. It is. You got yourself Uh, an Amsoil with Bronco on there. Nice. Yep. So that's the Brad Lovell shirt right there. All right. Uh All right. Let's see what this one is. I'm just busting these open. I was so excited to get all these shirts today. Oh, I like that one. Scott Birdsall. Oh, I want that. Right? Wait, wait, is no, that he, like a 4X? What, how big is no, this No, it's XL. Shirt? You're going to shrink them. Damn, that thing These are huge. all your shirts, by the way. Oh, awesome. These are all yours. All right, I like this one. Okay, what is this guy right here? All right, this is a an Amsoil... Pocket T. Oh, what's pocket T. That's yeah. nice. nice. All right, what's on the back? Uh, it is Amsoil. And this guy is Amsoil an official racing. Amsoil Racing because we are hashtag Team, Team Amsoil. Amsoil. Exactly. That's right. One more. You got more? I got another one. Uh, dude, I, I'm, uh, I'm re-wardrobing you. Okay. All right, this one right here. Right, that's a bank shirt. You've never seen this one before. Uh, oh, is this a new one? This one is just for employees. Oh, you didn't know it. Yesterday when I was at Banks uh, doing stuff with you and uh, Mr. Banks, mm-hmm. uh, I was wearing my Banks uh, House of Horsepower shirt under my nice shirt. Well, it doesn't do any good if you're wearing it under your Well, I, did, I, I didn't know that you were going to be there. I thought it was just a, a mm-hmm. simple Banks meeting. I wanted to look nice. So this one is for uh, staff only. Check okay. Yeah, I like that. Look at the back. Oh, that's cool. Right? Ah. Read right. it read it aloud. Banks D six thirtieth. How can it be D six thirty TH turbo hybrid? You already it's like a Cadillac Seville STS. That's the way it's it the same it. thing. It's diesel six cylinder. Yes. Three, three liter, liter turbo hybrid. Development yep. team. Yes, with the engine in the middle. Very cool. Yeah, and it's uh, like military that. colors. Can I tell you a funny story? You can tell me. We a spent funny story. weeks editing a video okay. to tell the whole world about how we developed the diesel hybrid Humvee for the U.S. Army. And they told you no. They told us no. We submitted it, and they said, <laughs> we submitted it, and they said you have been way too specific. <laughs> they said, you need to, and we turned in like a 17, no, it was like 19 or 20 minutes. Yeah. And they came back and go, not, not so, so much. much. Yeah. You've revealed much too much about our little program. Uh-huh. That was a lot of work uh-huh. to make that video. And they may nothing. never see the light. Well, the, the army will see it, but no, yeah. you won't. You won't see it. Which sucks. Yeah, that's okay. There's a lot of things we do here on the Truck Show Podcast that uh, no. hit the cutting room floor and no, you no, never no, see. No, no, That's because it's bad. This was good. All right. This was very entertaining. Well, let's uh, let's thank Nissan for coming back as our presenting sponsor. So if you're in the market for a mid-sized truck, head over to your local Nissan dealership where you can check out the Nissan Frontier. It starts at just $30,000, $30, nicely equipped. We're talking a 3.8 liter dual overhead cam, 24 valve V6. Oh, by the way, that is the engine. There is no base engine. There's no turbo. There's no hybrid. It's just a good, old-fashioned, dual overhead cam, reliable V6, backed by Nissan's 9-speed automatic, makes 310 horsepower, 280 pound-feet of torque, and tows up to 6,640 pounds, and that's because of its 
fully box frame. It's available in two body styles. And that $30,000 price is the King Cab S model. You get Nissan Connect's 8-inch color touchscreen. You get zero gravity seats. You get remote keyless entry. You get the 8-inch screen with Apple CarPlay integration. Utility track tie downs. You get uh, cabin filtration, power windows and locks. All that for thirty thousand bucks. It's a heck of a deal. It's the truck that has everything you need and nothing you don't. Head over to NissanUSA.com where you can build and price your new Frontier today. And for those of you that uh, are sporting a Duramax twenty seventeen to twenty twenty four L five P, Banks just dropped a bomb. It's called a Monster Ram, and it's an intake elbow. It's basically, it mounts to the turbo inlet. Not only is it cool looking and cast aluminum, it improves your throttle response. It extends your turbo life by slowing down the shaft speed because it increases air density. And it doesn't suffer from any of the turbo surge that all of the competitors do. Again, if you have a Duramax L5P and you're looking for better throttle response and a little bit of bling under the hood, head over to bankspower.com, type in your year making model and find your Monster Ram. And uh, again, we are so excited to have Amsoil. Both Lightning and I are huge fans and use it in our own vehicles. So when you're looking for a quality full synthetic lubricant for your truck, Amsoil has you covered with motor oil, lubricants, protectants, grease, additives, and more. Amsoil has been a pioneer in synthetic lubricants for more than 50 years and delivers wear protection, engine cleanliness, and fuel efficiency that conventional oils simply can't match. Amsoil's specialized products are engineered for extraordinary performance across automotive, racing, and power sports. And lighting, did you know Amsoil is the official oil and the title sponsor of the Ultimate Callout Challenge? I and did. They're also the official oil of the National Association of Diesel Motorsports. So oh, I didn't know that one. Their catalog must have thousands of things in it because uh, you could get lost in that thing, as I did the other day. So find out how Amsoil Synthetic Lubricants can save you money and time by helping your vehicle run better and last longer. When it comes to lubrication, Amsoil is the leader in synthetics. Find out more at Amsoil.com. The Truck Show. We're going to show you what we know. The truck, cause truck rides with the truck show. We have the lifted, we have the lowered, and everything in between. We'll talk about trucks that run on diesel and the ones that run on gasoline. The truck show, the truck show, the truck show. Oh, oh. It's the truck show with your hosts, Lightning and Holman. All right, Holman, uh, you said you needed our listeners yep. to help you make a decision. But yes. you know our listeners love to help you make poor decisions, so why I are you know. asking them? I think it's funny. <laughs> I <laughs> think right. it's funny. I'm a glutton right. for punishment. All right, in this bag, my buddy Ken G over at Long Beach Clothing Company that I used to own. All right. Oh, he made he made this. I'm going to give this to you, though. That's an air freshener for you. Oh, I know exactly. What that, why, <laughs> but why does it say censored? Uh-huh. Oh, that's a, that's uh, the meme so, everybody sends uh-huh. of the rather large man. Sporting, uh, well, let's just call him a tripod. Yes, yeah, he is. Okay, so I, he, so he's got a plotter okay. over there at the back of the yeah. clothing store. They make yeah. uh, stickers. All right, and I said, can you print me this sheet of stickers? Uh-huh. And these are stickers that I would be potentially applying to the back window of the TRX in hopes of deterring said future thieves from breaking the window that has not yet been put in my TRX because they're back ordered. Funny you should bring that up because I believe we have some emails from our listeners with some really good ideas I hadn't thought about before. Really? Yeah, so okay. we'll get to those later in the show. Well, well, it's, well, no, we no. should actually do that no, no, here. No, no. We're going to get to them later in the show. You tell us your stupid sticker idea and then they will redeem you with good idea. But here's where I want. Here's what I wanted to do. Right. I wanted to read these to you guys. I'm waiting. Let's okay. read. And then Go. I wanted to weigh in. So okay. let me know your opinion about these. All right. Either with an email or be preferable... On the five-star hotline, right. 657-205-6105. 657-205-6105. Tell me what you think of these potential stickers. I've already made these, so I'm hoping you guys like one of these. Which ones do you think will deter a thief from breaking the rear window so I don't have to go through this agony again? All right. The first one, Holman, is... Mm-hmm. You can read it. Uh, Igla Protected. That one's dumb. Okay. Well, yep. no, thank this you. second one is... Uh, key Pairing Mode Disabled. All right. All right. These are in silver, by the way. Yep. Silver these with are... uh, block Helvetica or something exactly. like that. Exactly. Uh-huh. All right. And this one, pretty straightforward. Uh, do not break glass. Yep. Do okay. not break that, glass. That, I think, is asking people to break your glass. All right. How about this one right here? Uh, that would be break glass, make noise. <laughs> break um, glass, make noise. Reminds me of a time that uh, 
I was at scout camp as a uh, as a counselor, and we had a one way or, or one single lane wide fourteen mile dirt road into camp, and the school buses were coming in with that week's campers. And a guy tried to go out the road, and one of our uh, counselors uh, who was out there, one of the staff members, Phil Brigandi, ran out after the car up the dirt road, waved him down, and all he could manage to get out before the bus came around the corner was, big yellow bus, go boom! <laughs> that, that was all he was able to. What? So that, I feel like that's that's that one right Why there. Why was he yelling? Break glass, make noise! Because he, they would have had a head-on collision with a bus full of 50 scouts. Oh. And he, he wasn't going to say Sir, stop. If you continue, a bus full of 50 scouts will ram into you. <laughs> big yellow no, bus, go big boom. yellow bus boat, go yeah. boom. He just shout, That's what he shouted out. <laughs> that's so. funny. All right, one more. Here you go. This is security protected. A little boring, but very you know, boring. These, uh-huh. I've, I've, these are literally die cut. Yeah. These are vinyl die cut yeah. stickers, they right? Look like it. How about this one? Read it slower. A vehicle does not run. A vehicle does not run. All mm. right. Mm. All right. And this one is your personal favorite. Uh, thieves will be shot. I, that That is, let's. Uh, I'm going to take that for the podcast studio door, and we'll put uh, no, that that's there. my only one. Right that there. one there. Okay, All right. So that is uh, that's your selection right there because I had white and silver made. Yeah. Right. And, uh, so mm. again, what do you guys like best for the back window? Did you like Igla protected? So if they're a, if they're a, a thief that knows their their shit, so to speak, mm. do they go? Oh, it's Igla. Nah. Let's turn away. I'm not going to nah. waste my time because um. I can't get past this security system. I don't think any of those are going to help you. No, so they're not going to like vehicle does not run, security protected, do not break glass, key pairing mode disabled, uh, break glass, make noise, or sh- thieves will be shot. Not thieves will be shot. Truckshowpodcast at gmail.com. Or the five star hotline, 657 205 6105. I'm being honest now, guys. Like, will do you, will any of these work? Have you been in a similar situation where you've had to put up a, you know, uh, uh, a guard dog sign or something because guys kept breaking into your yard? Or, like, what is the effective messaging? You put a guard dog inside your uh, truck, just lives there. No, nah, you know, like people have said, they're jokingly, but like, is there anything that will catch someone's attention in the two, literally, two seconds you have before they pop the window in? That's the question. Yeah. No? You don't think any of these will work? Mm, I mean, you could try them. I'm going to try one. Hmm. All right. Well, apparently there's some more suggestions All in right. the email inbox. I just that don't know we'll that a, later. a sticker in your back window is going to be the thing. What is? You need to listen to uh, our emails later in the show where our listeners <laughs> provide you with uh, scintillating ideas of well, how to protect your vehicle. none of these are going to work, I got a lot of spare stickers to send you guys. <laughs> All right. Uh, these will be shot. Again, we'll keep that one here. Um, I think the world would be a better place if you were lopping off fingers and ears from people who were thieves. We would end that stuff real quick. That's hey, I true. just got back from uh, Easter Jeep Safari and uh, took out the uh, 392, as you uh, might imagine. And I've got the Rhino Rack roof rack on it now with a set of max tracks up on top, and uh, drove out there and back, did almost 2,000 miles. And uh, what do you think my fuel economy was in the 392? Keep in mind, uh, Utah is at 80-mile-per-hour speed limit. So you had the new roof rack, and did you have the Lightner box on top? No Lightner box, but I did have the max tracks up there. I'm going to... Ah, 13.7. 13.7 miles per gallon. Uh, I averaged uh, just under 14 miles per gallon for the entire trip. And wow. one of my hand-calculated tanks was 15.5. Okay. Thought was pretty damn good in the 392. I mean, that's not bad. I mean, it's uh, totally acceptable. Yeah. So I was like, all right, I can live with that. I have not taken a long enough trip like that in the TRX. Not that we're comparing, but um, you did back in the day. I, mm-hmm. What did you? What's your longest trip when you had the, uh, I think our best, the Motor Trend Truck of the yeah, Year or whatever the, the hell it was? Four-wheeler Pickup truck of the year. I okay. think the best tank was high 14s or something like that. Uh, the yeah. highest I've gotten in the truck, I think, is 13, yeah, 7, 13. Hand eights. calculated or what the screen says? With the screen. It's wrong because you're not calibrated. It's on 37s, yeah. So you're not calibrated, number one. And then uh, number two, it's always about, even once you calibrate, they're about half a mile per gallon optimistic. Mm. Almost all Stellantis products. Really? Yeah, which is super annoying. You know what's funny is I, I get in. Just about any Stellantis vehicle, it's always like half a mile optimistic. I get in the CRV, and it's it under. Is, it overperforms. No, it's literally the exact same as hand calculated. Oh, really? Every time, mind blowing. I'm like, how how can they get it so right and nobody else can? 
I mean, Honda and Toyota get a lot of things I, right that the, the American car companies just can't. Just saying it's like it's literally the same tenth yeah. on the back. Every time. Well, you, you're trading excitement uh, for, for boring and accurate. I get it, but why can't excitement be accurate too? The Speedo's right. It knows how much gas it's metering through that monster. You know, here's know. the other thing I realized. So those of you with big truck engines will get this, but so when I'm idling the 392... It has an adverse effect on fuel economy. When I'm idling the Honda, the Honda just, it'll idle for five or six days. It doesn't care. It'll mm-hmm. probably still pull out 20 miles per gallon on the tank. There's this delta of how much fuel it takes to dump in the 392 at idle that you need to be going at least like 20 miles an hour to get some decent fuel economy that's over like, you know, 15 or something. Well, I mean, like it ultimately is about, I mean, this is a, a question for Gail Banks because he is famous for coming up with the actual horsepower required for the engine to run itself. Mm-hmm. In the case of my truck, for example, it's just shy, like 49 horsepower just to run itself. Mm-hmm. Just to idle, it's exerting f- almost yeah. 50 horsepower. Just to sit there and run. Because it's it's turning a blower but, that barely... Well, what's, what's interesting is it's like if I'm steady state in the 392 at 60, it'll be doing 22 miles per gallon. You know, you move it up to 75 and that drops down to about 14 and a half. 80, it's about 14, maybe th- high 13s. Mm-hmm. But there's this delta of the 392 needs to be having some sort of rolling movement before it becomes a- anything that resembles efficiency. Whereas the Honda, it just is efficient all the time. It can just idle, it doesn't care. Well, it's, doesn't, like a, it's like a generator. Yeah, you, well, you sit there at a light and you don't watch your miles per gallon go down as you're sitting at the light. You do in the 392. So it's kind of weird having the little tiny, you know, two liter-ish Four cylinder and a six point four liter V eight, and it's uh, two completely dissimilar driving experiences. And, and no, tur- oh, no turbo on that CRV either. No. And speaking of, uh, so Gail has a black wing mm-hmm. that's been in the shop. Just got it back this morning. All right. Well, he still had that pile of Cadillac CT S five, whatever the 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 V or excuse me, whatever the SUV version is. The it's five. like a it's like a wagon that someone put yeah. helium in. It yeah, just it's, looks boom. It's it's dumb. Yeah. And Gail hates that thing. Hates it. He was telling a pretty funny story while you were there about his one wheel peels. Like he's he's like, oh yeah, it's got torque steer driving me freaking oh, crazy. Yeah. He, he was very angry about that. But he comes out, sees me in the CRV, and the first thing he says to me is, "Well, that doesn't look like a race car." And I looked at him, I'm like, says the guy who's driving the mommy mobile with the Cadillac badge engineering, <laughs> and he goes, it's a loner. And I'm like, well, yeah, so is this. This is my daughter. So we basically just traded insults <laughs> in the middle of the street uh-huh. between the two cars that aren't really our, our, our normal cars that we yeah. would associate with each other, Yeah, which was pretty funny. <laughs> and there's a couple, I think Steven was walking by, there's some guy that's coming out of that other bank's building, uh-huh. and they're just watching, like, basically, Jousting. Gail and I just <laughs> throwing verbal jabs at each other from... Uh, from opposite ends of the street. It was pretty funny. Yeah, I've been uh, stealing whatever vehicle is just left over at the end of the night. And uh-huh. it was that crappy gray 20, 2007. Nobody liked that. Then I had, then I had Why is it people want the old dually where like the seat springs are coming up through where your butt cheeks go? People will drive that all day long, but that's, you, you that's get, what I'm driving now. All right. What, oh, but so uh, tonight I drove the 2007 and a half. Okay. Because normally you dually. have the gray one that, no, that's like the bastard child. Well, there's, so there's two. They look identical. One is 07 and one is the 12, and they're this uh, that that dark gray metallic. Yeah, and granite crystal metallic. So the 12 right now has no air conditioning and no heat. So mm-hmm. whatever, it's just whatever ambient is. Uh, so that one sucks balls to drive. <laughs> but the I'm I'm driving the dually, so I'm I'm pulling out as Gail is 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 pulling out at the same time, and uh, and he looks across at me and he goes, he's like, why are you driving that piece? Of <laughs> and like it's it's a it's bank. Hey, he owns one. it. Yeah, he owns it. It's his. He just he thinks it's funny. He's like, why do we still have that? I'm like, because everyone Cause loves it. I drive it. Yeah, I because I'm driving it. Yeah, because it's there's just something about that uh, that old 07 body style. You know, when the dually looks cool, and uh, I don't know. And someone put the dually wheels backwards, the insides on the outside, and the outside on the inside. How do and, you not know? And so we had powder coated the outers. I don't know, two three years ago, so they looked decent. They were you know matte black. Well, they flipped them, so now the in and insides are on the outsides, and they're so rusted, and it just looks so ridiculous and so embarrassing. I'm like, how how does that even happen? That's just dumb. <laughs> That's just dumb. All right, Holman, are you ready to call Jim Pickering, Beaverton Valley Times bestselling author? Is he, though? I don't know. I made it up because he's from Beaverton. Well, let's ask him. All right, let's dial.
Hey, guys. Jim, it's Lightning and Holman, Truck Show Podcast. How you doing? Good. How are you? We're Fantastic. great. We're ready to uh, we're ready to talk C ten C twenties book writing and <laughs> linkage so magazine much. exactly. But we but can't right. do it. We, we've got a jingle till we play our jingle first. Don't move. All right, go for it. Pull up a stool and share. Pull up a stool and share a story. Pull up a stool and share. How about you pull up a stool and share with us? Jim, I hear that you are the uh, number one best-selling author on the book list at Beaverton Valley Times. Is that true? <laughs> I don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> I just looked for the smallest newspaper I could find in Beaverton, Oregon, where you're from. And I figured that uh, might be well, well, I was just going to say, we claim to be the number one truck enthusiast podcast, so we can bestow upon him uh, number one author from Beaverton. I was going to say New York, best-selling, <laughs> New York Times best-selling author, but then... Oh, I, you, you mean the... Uh, the Schmoob Schmork Schmines? Uh-huh, the Schmork Schmines yeah. or the yeah, yeah, yeah. Schmamazon best-selling author? <laughs> well, right. we, can, we can agree that maybe maybe I'm the best one you talked to today. Oh, hey, there <laughs> yeah, you go. See, there you go. <laughs> All that right, works. so I am, I'm sitting here with uh, two books, and uh, I, I got an email from uh, a gentleman at CarTech and said, hey, uh, we've got uh, Jim, and he – has written two books for us, the Chevy GMC Trucks 73 to 87 and the Chevy GMC Trucks 67 to 72. One of them is brand new. One of them is on its second printing, and we'd love Mm -hmm. to have them on the podcast. And so being an old school print guy and somebody who has been around this world for 25 years and still has no idea how you get a book deal or how that works. I, was, I went, I totally want to know more. I was going to say, uh, he's holding two books in his hand, and that is, that's two books more than Holman has written. That's right. right no, I mean, I've literally written <laughs> volumes upon volumes of stuff, but not in one coherent uh, uh, book cover to book cover uh, you know, format. How does this, uh, yeah, well, how did you end up getting bestowed with this, uh, this duty? Well, it's certainly a process. So, where it started was um, I've been in the magazine world for a long time since geez, since about 2006. At the time that the first book came together, I was running a magazine called American Car Collector on the editorial side, and we were doing reviews, book reviews, and so I knew the people at CarTech, and they would send me books to review, and we would assign to have them reviewed, and that was all great. And you said, uh, "Hey, these books are shit. I can do better." <laughs> no, no. Okay. <laughs> what happened was I was I was doing how to content for the magazine. I was I was writing it and shooting it myself. And I think what happened was the guys that work at CarTech said, "Hey, you know, why don't we have him do some books for us?" And they started asking. And at the time, you know, I wasn't I wasn't sure I was ready to take that on because it's eighty thousand words, it's four hundred photos. You've got nine months to do it. And, you know, in addition to working full time and, and, you know, I kept saying, well, I'm not sure that this is going to work right now. I I need to have some more time to think about it. And I don't have the space. You know, I didn't have a garage that was big enough. And and then I moved and ended up in a bigger house with a little bigger garage. And they called me at the wrong time. And either in a moment of clarity or weakness, I said, hey, (laughs) and that's how I got started with the with the 73 to 87 book. Now, initially, they wanted me to do the um, 67 to 72s. And those things had exploded in the market, and I it couldn't make it work, you know, mathematically in terms of being able to buy one and be able to build it. And well, so I, well, I was going to Jim. I, I, first. I, I, so you said you didn't have a garage. Is that because I mean, most writers just write; they do research, and they, after interviewing many, many people, they assemble thousands of words in a book. But you wanted to do it hands on. Is that why you needed a garage? Yeah. So I had learned, well, I have a, I had a garage and I, I, at the time it was full of 66 Chevrolet full-size car, which is the first car that I bought way back when and have had ever. And so that car wasn't going to go anywhere. And I I didn't have room to take another one apart and also keep my other car. So it just wasn't going to work. So for that reason, that was, that was my convenient excuse as to why I couldn't do it. And then all of a sudden my excuse was gone. So I had to, had to try something. Where do you even start? I mean, because and here's why. I, I would I would imagine there's some sort of an outline, right? So for those of you who are listening, who are going, oh, you know, tell me more about these books. You have come across these books your entire automotive life, whether it was in a shop at a Barnes and Noble. There's uh, companies that have these how to completely redo X Y Z vehicle. So there is some sort of a format, right? And and you had to figure out, can I tackle 100 percent of these subjects accurately? to uh, to make a whole book out of it. Right. So the first step in this process 
is to have me or whoever is going to be right come up with an outline that is then submitted back to CarTech and they look it over and decide whether or not that's going to work for them. And for me, being in the magazine world, I had learned early on that if I had to depend on other people, either owners or, or suppliers or whatever, it was harder for me to, to hit my deadline because I, I was dealing with people that didn't have to live under that same deadline. And so I knew if I was going to do this and I was going to you know take the time to write 80,000 words and shoot all the photos and all that stuff, it ha I had to control my own destiny, which meant I had to build my own truck. And so I needed lighting that I could control. I needed a space that I could control, and I needed to be able to um, source parts on my own timeline, so that I could work it all out and still hit that deadline. And that's I think that's the most challenging part of all of this is coming up with your plan and then executing it and making sure that you actually hit that deadline. It's a lot harder than it seems when you're when you're working full time and this is something you're just doing aside, you know. <laughs> hey, lighting. Is this the point where we realize we did the wrong jingle for him and we have to do the other one? You're talking about <laughs> which one? Innovator Motorator? Shop yeah, Talk. Oh, Shop Talk? Oh, sure. I guess we can do that. Hold on a second. What's in the shop? What's in the shop? Just what's in your shop? A segment where handsome guys talk about your bill. A crazy consumption that'll keep the whole thrill. What did you make? Why is it cool? We all want to know. And now it's time for some Shop Talk. I don't know how that comes across through the phones because it's kind it's of a funny to us. jingle. I don't know if you can hear, but it's, uh, now it's time to do some shop talk. So, is this your truck in the seventy-three to eighty-seven? Right inside in the uh, that's page. Is that officially page one? What would you call it on the I right would, hand? I would is say page one. That would be yeah, that'd be page one. So, is that your truck? That's just uh, the cab sitting on a uh, on a chassis yep. with the four wheels. Okay, and and at what yeah, stage did my you? Dad's driveway. Okay, yeah. got it. So then, did you buy one for both the 67 to 72 and the 73 to 87 books? I did, yeah. I started with, with a, the one you're looking at there in the 73 to 87 is a 79 short bed that I found on the streets of Portland that um, it was, it was, it was not particularly expensive. And when I got it home, it was really good underneath. I think what had happened was the person who had owned it originally bought it as like a fishing truck or something because the bed was perfect. And it had some fishing stickers and stuff on the back window. And then it just by looking at the truck, it looked like somebody had, maybe the guy had died or something and he sold it to somebody else. And then it sat outside for a few years and it had all the paint had kind of weathered down to a dull shine, you know, and it had a little bit of rust here and there. And it was, it's the guy had run into a couple things with it, but the bones were really good. And, you know, as I took it apart, as you see in that first shot there, you know, I, I tore it basically all the way down. I didn't take the cab off the frame because I didn't need to, but everything else um, I took off and cleaned up and put back on and did a little bit of paint work to it and stuff. But but it, that one worked out really well simply because I bought it at the right time. It was right before those trucks took off. I mean, right before they took off in value. So I got lucky on that one. Now, did you reach out? Does CarTech pick up the, you know, foot the bill for this or is this on you? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, there's there's an advance that you get for for doing the work but the advance doesn't generally cover all the work that you need to do right and so for me it worked out because i had some contacts in the in industry via the the how-to stuff that i've been doing before and you know when you call up a company and say hi i'm writing a book i want to feature your product generally they say yeah that's great we we'd love to do that and you can work out a deal that way which tends to you know cover some of the cost and makes it so you can do some of the things that you might not otherwise get to do the subhead of these, it's like Chevy GMC trucks, 67, 72, and the other one is 73, 87. But the bottom, how to build and modify. This is the guide to give you a general, like he, you've got specifics in here from suspension, <laughs> engine, interior, dash, you name it, every part of the truck. You could have gone 10 different ways on each of these trucks. You could have gone, mm -hmm. you know, you got to got lifted, lowered, street performance. I mean, how did you decide what was right for the either you or the general populace? So generally what I tried to do with every chapter in these books is, is cover all of the bases of the things that you could do. And then I explain what I did and why I did it. So I try to explain everything as clearly as possible. Like, you know, with, with regard to the suspension, well, you can, you can cut a set of coils and drop a truck that way. Or, you know, you can buy drop spindles or, you know, this, that, the other thing, however you want to do it. I went with a coilover kit and this is why I did it. And then you can explain 
what the benefits are, what the costs are, so that people can make their own decisions. Now, I make it, I try to make it pretty clear at the beginning of both books that this is just one way of a hundred thousand different ways you could go. And the point really isn't to say you could only build it this way, but that this is, you know, a way that you could do it and this is how it would turn out. And it's not as challenging as you might think. The steps are not that hard. You just begin and and see it through. When you're looking at these books, the books that you're doing in particular are how to build and modify versus the maybe, you know, the, the Hiltons or Cha- uh, Haynes or some of those other ones that are how to service your vehicle or how to pack a wheel bearing. I mean, you're really taking to the next level of how to make this truck your own. So you have a little bit more, I guess, creative leeway mm-hmm. into how you explain the topic yeah. because it's the custom world, not necessarily the how to repair and keep your OE vehicle on the road. Right. It's not necessarily about restoration. If I wanted to write a restoration book, it would be very different. <laughs> yeah. You know, the the fun part for me is taking something and, and making it personalized, just like you were saying, and, and having fun with it and making something that is better to drive than it would have been originally, more fun to drive, maybe faster, maybe stops better. The kinds of things that will make you actually want to use the vehicle, especially in modern traffic. I talk about that a little bit, I think, in both books. You know, at one point I had restored a 72 K10. It was a orange and white Chevrolet long bed. I love that truck. And even though it was orange, I drove it daily for a while. And I, I felt like almost once a week, every people were trying to run into me. I mean, they couldn't see it. Your average commuter couldn't see it. And it, it sort of made me believe that if you're going to drive an older, old, older vehicle, I don't care what it is, you need to have a little bit of an edge over your average daily driver. It needs to have stop better stopping ability, better acceleration, better handling, whatever, just so that you can survive. You know? What do you what do you mean, Jim, by the the orange? You're saying like because of the sunset or something? I don't I don't understand that they couldn't was, see you. It was a bright orange truck, and even though it was bright orange, they're too busy looking at their phones or playing with the radio or whatever. Your average commuter, they're just not paying attention. And so, even though my truck was neon orange, they still oh, couldn't I see what see you're it. saying. Got it. Yeah. So when you started, some of the preface in these books, you're talking about, you've got a laundry list of the people that helped you, including your father. Yeah. But you even think like yeah, oh yeah. The, the the guy who taught you how to weld, basically, and gave you your first welder. Uh-huh. So you literally uh-huh. started from the beginning. He has to come up with 80,000 words. <laughs> no, I mean, this That's is right. before he gets into the meat of the book. He's look, like, look, look at the part where he says, the LS is very, 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 very popular. <laughs> really? yeah. Yeah. Six varies? That's uh-huh. how I write. So I assume everybody else does. I was just joking with some one of the guys at work. He was looking at a huge project. It's like, I'm overwhelmed. And so you yeah. must have had to design this truck and say, I'm going to build a whole truck myself. How do I do this? And then you had to you had to learn mm-hmm. all the skills, all the metalwork skills and everything else. Take, take us through that. I wanted to be as genuine as possible. And with regard to the first book that I did, one of the biggest regrets that I had was that I didn't buy a long bed and cut it down because I feel like with truck values where they are right now, that's what a lot of guys are going to have to do if they want to build something like what they see in the magazines. Right. And so, but I ended up buying a short bed because it was cheap enough. And I, I I feel like I got lucky in that sense. And so when I got to the point where I was going to build the second book or the second truck for the second book, I knew that the first thing I had to do was cut a bed down, but I have never welded before in my life. So this was the kind of thing that I thought was sort of a legitimizing thing. I'm, I'm going to have to learn this too, you know? And so the first thing I did was call a couple of friends of mine. You know, I've been in the, in the, in the magazine and the, just the hot rod world for a long time. I grew up next door to a guy that built street rods when I was a little kid. He's the guy that, that um, lent me his welder. You know, I have some friends that paint cars and, and some other people. And I just started asking questions, you know, what is it I need to do? What do I need to set up? How is this going to work? so that I can make this happen. You know, I picked up a door skin that was off an El Camino and just immediately started cutting it up and welding it back together as best I could to learn the settings on the welder. And here's what happens if you go too fast. How badly badly were you uh, boogering it up at first? It was terrible. (laughs) (laughs) It was really bad. And, you know, it's, it's, and I talk about that in the book, if you're going to try and do this, the best thing you could do is just begin, right? You just get some spare metal and start playing with it. It's not, rocket science you can figure it out but, and and that's what i ended up doing you know I, I burnt some holes in the bed when i was welding it back together but it yeah you out. just fill those up it's no big so. deal <laughs> uh okay so going mm-hmm. back to the books the uh, 67 to 72 uh book is new our understanding is the 73 to 87 you wrote a while back and now it's on its second printing so 
let's talk about yeah. the demand. Obviously, uh, you and I both live in worlds where uh, we're hanging on to print. We have uh, you know associations with print magazines. You're writing books. What does that look like? Who's buying those books today? And obviously, there's enough of a market out there that Cartech commissioned you to do the 67 to 72 book. Yeah, I mean, it seems like there's there's a really robust market for it, and more so than I expected that there would be. Um, you know, I, I I look in on the Amazon rankings every once in a while just to see how it's doing, and it, both of the books tend to to rank fairly high up just in terms of searches. So I know people are out there looking for them, and and I can tell you from my own um, use patterns, having a book in hand is really handy when you're working on something because you don't have to go back and find the web page. You don't have to go back and try and find the video. An ad doesn't you load can, in the middle of your reading. Well, right. you know what? And a highlighter right. doesn't work on YouTube. You can't highlight with a you know a bright <laughs> yellow marker. You can scribble all over these yeah. things and come back or dog ear the pages and come back and go, oh, I really like that break setup. And then come back to it, you know, a few yeah. months later when you got the cash. You know, and I think there's definitely something to be said for having all of those things on the web. And, you know, that that is definitely a, a benefit to everybody. But print is not dead the way that people say it is. Um, and I think that's been obvious, at least in the book sales in, in for these last two, that people are interested in it and they are buying them. So, well, when you look at the and, and for the advertisers or for the people that are supplying the parts, um, you know, the, the the people that are buying the books are are spending, you know, 30 bucks on a book. And that is a qualified potential buyer of their products. And let's you know, face it, so, a lot of this is evergreen, right? Like the tech that you're writing mm-hmm. about today is still going to the, the parts may change and evolve a little bit. But overall, these vehicles and the tips that you're sharing are going to be good. If I were to pick up this book in 20 years or something like that, it would it would still be valuable. That's the hope. <laughs> now, do you ever hear back from people, any readers? Do they try and reach you and say, hey, uh, my dad and I finished this project thanks to your book or um, you inspired me to take my project a certain direction? Or is it sort of just you throw it out into the ether and it is what it is? It's a little bit of both. I did just this last weekend meet up with a guy who bought my book at Cars and Coffee here in town because he had a bunch of questions about his own 67 C20. And he wanted to see mine and he wanted to ask his questions and let me see his and try to come up with work with him to come up with a plan for what he should attack and how he should attack it. And that was pretty fun um, just to, to look over this guy's truck and, and to, to see what it is, you know, he's eager to do and, and to have him look at mine and can point out the things that I think could have, could have been done, done better on mine and things that he could do to his. It was it was pretty fun. And that kind of stuff does happen from time to time. Within three pages of opening up the first book, the 6772, I learned that these trucks, the Chevy trucks, were called action trucks. And I look at home yeah, and, and I go, line. I said, <laughs> what? All these years, I yeah. never knew they were called action, the action line? Since when? Mm-hmm. What? That was a GM thing, and I guess it just never took off. I mean, they wanted to call the square bodies the rounded line, and that was completely opposite of what it ended up <laughs> <happening>. <laughs> So there you go. I mean, it's they, they can't dictate everything, I guess. You go, you weave history throughout these books. It's not just how-to articles. You you tell backstory. You give production quantities of, of all the different years, C10s versus C20s and the K-trucks and stuff like that. But something I also learned that you, you talked about when the muscle car revolution happened, they quickly mm-hmm. went up in price and they pushed a lot of enthusiasts who couldn't afford those into trucks. A hundred percent. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. So yeah, basically, I, once the Mustangs and that happen. yeah, once the Mustangs and Camaros were gone, two things happened: the Mopars got popular, and the Chevy and Ford trucks got popular. Because if you think about it, in the '60s, a lot of those vehicles were all parts bin vehicles. So there's a lot of part, parts of Mustangs in the in the trucks, and there's a lot of Camaro parts that were shared with the Chevy trucks. And so to get that V8 yeah. rear wheel drive experience, that was the next best thing to the muscle cars was the trucks. And that's when you saw trucks really take off is once all the really good Mustangs and Camaros were gone, it kind of pushed everybody. Now the Mopars are getting rare. The uh, Ford and Chevy 67 72s are getting re- rare. So you're seeing people move into square bodies. Mm-hmm. And if you want a truck of that vintage, really, it's the Dodge trucks that are starting to take off or even more so seeing a lot of the internationals now. I feel like we all should have seen this coming from a mile away. I mean, I, I watched a friend of mine, and I think it was 1999. He had a 70 C10, and he had a 71 Chevelle. And this kid was, you know, 18 years old. And I thought for sure he was going to sell the truck and build the Chevelle. And what he ended up doing was selling the Chevelle and using it to paint the truck. 
And I thought, what is happening here? You know, because back then the Chevelle was the car that all of my friends wanted, you know, and, and here's this kid who was selling it and, and using the money to build a truck. And I'm happy to say, you know, 23 years later, he still has that truck and it still looks wonderful. That same paint job looks really great. I see him at the same cars and coffee fairly regularly. And so, yeah, I mean, it, it, with muscle cars going where they went, it was only, it was inevitable, I think, that the trucks were going to come up in value because that's what people were buying and building. And underneath, like you guys are saying, they're basically the same thing. Small block Chevys, big block Chevys, turbo 400 transmissions, four speeds. I mean, solid axles, the 12 volts a little bit different in a truck versus a car, but you get the idea. I mean, you can go out and do burnouts in a truck just as easy as you can in a Camaro or a Chevelle or Maybe or easier because so of the, the weight. Yeah, the weight distribution. Yeah. Plus, yeah, on the Chevy yeah. trucks of the 67 to 72 vintage, it's coil sprung, right? So there's a lot more options for handling more, and, yeah. and riding stuff that you, you know, might not think about, but it's it's not that different of an experience of uh, of building a Camaro in like a Pro Street style or something like that. Like they're, I don't know. And right. I just I love the 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 sixties trucks, the sixty seven to seventy two, whether it's the F one hundred or whether it's the C ten, when they're lowered and they're wide and mm-hmm. they have the right wheel and tire fitment on them. There's just there's just nothing better. And it's funny because if you like that better than the square body. Yeah, I mean, I, I like the square body, but it's a different truck. It's it's. Uh, mm-hmm. See, I'm not a square body fan either. I know people love square bodies. It's probably when yeah. they grew up, right? My uncle Warren had a '85 or an '86 1500. I think it was a 305 fire engine red regular cab short box. It's a short wide, and he bought that thing brand new, bench seat in the front. I remember him pulling it up to my grandma's house for the first time. I'm like, you look at it, you're like, holy crap, look at that, you know, right? I was well, what probably nine mm-hmm. years old, something like that, maybe eight, and I I knew an awesome red truck when I saw one, right? Like that's one of those ones that you're like, man, that thing is cool, but they look better lowered. Mm-hmm. They do I look mean, better lowered, yeah. And yeah, I, you, you also sure. don't realize on the '67 to '72 Chevys, the way the body lines are, you know, a lot of people shorten the bed of a long bed to turn into a short bed, but the color choice on that truck hides it a lot. You almost need mm-hmm. to see it in a dark color like black. What you don't realize is that the the rear three quarter view of that pickup bed fender drops almost like it's going in trying to be a fin of, of replicating right. that fin shape of those cars that era. Mm-hmm. And if you've never seen it at the right angle or the right sunlight, you'll never pick it up. And I saw I remember the first time I saw a black uh C ten, sixty seven seventy two, rear three quarter at the exact right light, and I'm like, holy crap, they designed basically kind of a, a vibe of the old Chevy car fins on the side of the truck. Yeah. I'm trying to picture what you mean. You, you, well, you can probably find a picture in this book yeah, here. I, I sure you can, can find it in the, yeah, you can find it in the book. If, if you go to the section where I shorten the bed, there's there's a, a whole part that is devoted to keeping that curve intact. You have to cut diagonally across it in order to be able to match up. I'm looking at it right here. Yep, page, page, page 38, together. step 10. Mm-hmm. And, um, and that's that's from a guy named um, Kyle Oxberger. That's Metal Ox um, down in Arizona. That's his method for shortening a bed, and he's quite good at it. I've heard of Metal Ox. He's a legend. And yeah. so a couple questions. One, yeah. why were they producing so many long beds, and why does no one want a long bed today? Because personally, I think the long bed is better looking when it's lowered. I don't know about like yeah. regular height or lifted, but lowered a long bed just looks so cool. It's like a freight train. And and the follow up Oh yeah. The proportions are just right. Right. Um, yeah. And the follow yeah. up, why is Arizona, we've talked about this before, the the Mecca of the C ten culture today? They they're everywhere. But really <laughs> it is it yeah. yeah. So first thing is is uh, beds and second thing is Arizona. Well I think you get a lot of farmers back in the day that bought trucks to be used as trucks, right? And so your vast majority of pickups, because they are designed to be pickups, they're just going to have a long bed. That's, I think, most people, when they're buying a truck to be used when it was new, were just buying them that way because that was the most useful option for them. And in terms of whether or not that's popular, I think a lot of that comes down to the collector world and a lot of that comes down to what fits in a garage. Um, ah. You know, a, a, a short bed will fit in the same place a Camaro will fit, you know, and, and a long bed takes a lot more space. And if you're going to build something, it you've got the room, that's great. But, you know, I, I think you're right that the, the proportions are, are right when you've got a lowered long bed. I mean, um, I, I had no you know, idea, I, I Jim, that, that for example, in 1971, they made the half ton C10 short beds. They made 53,000. Mm-hmm. 
of the half-ton C10 long beds. Holman, how many do you think they made? 274. 224,000. Ah, so close. So like yeah. 53,000 to 224,000. Well, you have to remember, back then people didn't use their truck as a personal use vehicle as they do today. And collectors right. today, they want something sporty with a wheelbase that approximates the muscle cars because it handles better yeah. and it and basically looks better and has more of a sporty uh, a sporty vibe to it. Um, but yeah, back then, you know, a personal use pickup truck was like the, the nice truck you take to, to church, but the long bed was the, uh, you know, or to town and the long bed was the one with hay bales in the back and, and, you know, doing work with. And that really gets to the heart of why these trucks are popular right now also. And that's simply because this, these trucks are built, were built in the era where pickups were becoming something that people drove for more than just work. You know, you're, you're 67 and newer trucks, you're starting to see things more frequently like power steering, like air conditioning, power brakes, things that are you would be more likely to see in cars are starting to make their way into pickups. And the nice thing about that, at least for people these days, is that your vehicle, your pickup looks and feels like an old truck, but it doesn't necessarily drive like one. Even one that hasn't been modified, it still has the option of having power st- power steering and power brakes and air conditioning and, and some of the nicer things on the inside that make it more comfortable to use. Well, if they ever do a, a 67 to 72 Ford one, I'll, I'll just donate my truck to the cause because it's been sitting for about five years under yeah. a, a tarp in a warehouse. Yeah, but, you uh, don't know about that. Yeah. Uh, that that yeah, project we, went we, south. Anyway. Yeah. Um, no, wait, wait, he has to answer the Arizona thing first. <laughs> Because it's dry. Oh, right, right. Is it dry? Is it it's simple dry. as that? dry? That's, that's, that's it? Yeah. Well, I think that's the big thing. I think the, the trucks down there, and it's the same thing for where I found my 67, right? I, I, I had learned early on that if I was going to build one of these trucks, I needed to find one that came from a dry place because they all rust in the same places. And I didn't want to devote a lot of time to rust repair. So it was going to be the desert somewhere. I ended up going north. I went to the Tri-Cities up in Washington State and found my, my truck in a wrecking yard up there. But down in Arizona, I mean, they've got different problems. Their, their um, window seals are all dry rotted and, and cracking, you know, from the sun. And, you know, the interiors are shot and the dash pads are shot. But the metal is all in really good shape. Why? Because it doesn't rain. It's just I think it's as simple as that. Speaking of rust now, you can buy basically any of these trucks all the parts you need, you can call it brothers' trucks, basically, and buy every panel. You can rebuild one from you scratch. Can, uh, from almost. Not, you don't even need the truck. You just need a frame. You call, well, yeah. You get the yeah. chassis, right? There's, there's you can get the wiring to, harness. You get the suspension. You can get wheels, and tires, get brake lines, steering wheel, lines, interior, yeah, all of it. Like literally, you don't even need the original. I mean, if you could make up a VIN, which I'm sure some people have, you know, it's like <laughs> it's like a Harley. You just do a special construction C10. I guess my question mm-hmm. is. At, at what point does it not become a, the real deal anymore? Because you can buy all of these pieces. Like, where do you stop? That's a good question. And it's funny. I, I've spent a lot of time um, defending some of the choices that I made when I built my pickup. And, and some of those things are the original bench seat, um, the original gauges with their weathered you know, um, needles that aren't quite orange anymore. And to me, there's kind of an X factor there of, the, the bits and pieces that are still original that make it feel old, make it feel like that truck that I remember my, my dad having when I was a little kid or, you know, that I worked on when I was early on in the days when I was wrenching as a, as a mechanic, that kind of stuff. And when you build one from scratch, I mean, they're great because you can have everything brand new if that's what you want, but it does miss something there. I think that they're the, the evidence of the passage of time is, is sort of an important part to the whole process. And you will only get that with a truck that's been around the block a few times. All right, I've got a question similar to the start of Lightning's question, but I'm going to finish differently. You could have any of these trucks, all the parts to build it. Which one are you choosing? Are you going with the 67 to 72, or are you going with the 73 to 87? And why? Knowing what you well, know from, that, from doing these books. That's a good question. I think the 67 to 72 is my favorite. That's what I would have done out of the gate, simply because I've I've – had a number of them and they've there's just something about them i mean if you've ever owned one it, it's it's really hard to sell it and you always end up buying it back <laughs> <laughs> in some shape or form right and they just weasel their way into your life and then you're stuck you just become a truck person and, and all of a sudden you're a c10 guy you know and and you don't really know how it happened but it did and so for me i think that's that's where i would i would go again if i was going to do it again um but at this point you know it's it's funny when i build these trucks and write these books 
I'm looking at it in terms of content and different steps, you know, different chapters. I'm not looking at it in terms of building a finished product. And every time, and I should, and it sounds funny to say every time, but both times I've kind of come out of it at the end and, and sat up and looked at this thing and gone, oh, that, that's actually a pretty cool truck. It's, it's all come together into something. And the point was to do each of the steps and to document each of the steps. And it wasn't to build a, you know, a perfect vehicle for the end product. Has anyone penned anything for a car tech for the uh, 64 to 66? Not that I know of. I think that's one that they've been trying to assign. Um, I know they had some Fords that they wanted to do. And um, I think there's an OBS one in the works right now for the newer trucks. Um, and I know that there's an earlier one. I think there's a, a 47 to 54 that is complete, I think. Um, I'm not sure, but I'd have to go back and look. Yeah, because I hadn't seen anything on the... Uh, I built a 66 recently. Holman bought it for a dollar mm-hmm. for me as a, as a present. <laughs> Not officially well, a present. Only the, half the world knows about that. Yeah, I know. Because so. the uh, <laughs> historical revisionist that went on in the uh, the public uh, story of the vehicle. But, yeah. anyway, but that's beside the so point. Bought one that it was running and driving from one of our listeners. Thank you, Sean, for selling that to us. And then we sunk a few hundred thousand dollars into it and turned it into a SEMA truck. And uh, against then, all good advice, against all good advice, and, and when it when we had sunk many hundreds of thousands of dollars into the vehicle, I had to give the pink slip to the company that did all that work that I work for, <laughs> and it is no longer mine. And it is, although it does feel original and old because we used a lot of the rusty body. I mean, it's just there's a lot of rust holes in it still. We repaired the panels that. Um, we didn't want to leak and also were safety issues, but everything else you can still see the rust in the original patina and, you know, dropped in a supercharged Duramax and a Ford nine inch nice. and, you know, sitting on a roadster shop chassis and all that stuff. And we are, t- is that a humble brag about you, the book you should have written? I, I don't have the talent <laughs> to, or the skills to, uh, to write a book like this, that, like Jim has. But it would be interesting to, uh, I, I didn't have any reference material other than YouTube videos. There was no book that I could find. So right. I would be excited for something for the 6466. Yeah, absolutely. So Jim, uh, your day job, uh, you said it was with uh, LinkageMag.com, so Linkage Magazine. Can you uh, tell us a little bit yes. about that? Yeah, so Linkage is a magazine that um, I worked, I, I founded with, Donald Osborne and the Audrey Museum and Chester Allen, who is uh, an executive editor that I worked with for, he's over 15 years at um, Sports Car Market prior. And we began um, this whole project back in the summer of 2020 with the idea being that, you know, that you get people that buy and restore cars over and over and over again. They're in the market to, you know, to build and, and to have these cars that they spend way more than they're worth to build. And then they turn around and sell them for less than they you know, they actually have in them. And then they go and do it again. The whole idea behind this thing was trying to explain the passion behind the car world that's driving these people to do this stuff. And the way that we look at it is, well, if you break passion down, it's experiences, opinions, and values, right? That, those are the three things that kind of drive people to do what they do in the car world. And so we decided that we would build a magazine that was aimed at those three pillars and try to sort of track what's happening in the car world via those topics. And so that's what we've been doing. We've, we started out as a quarterly, now we're a bi-monthly and we've got some great columnists. We've got some great features that we put in there. We cover some auction stuff so that people can track the market and see what's happening in, in the auction world. And it's, um, it's been a lot of fun. It's, it's printed on high end paper and, uh, you know, each issue is about 188 pages, I think right now. And, um, it's been, uh, it's been growing pretty significantly over the past couple of years and, and, um, we hope to see it do even better. So you're tracking, I mean, some of the, uh, on the homepage, which is linkagemag.com, talking about these auctions, you're everything from like a 22 Bugatti, uh, Bugatti Chiron at uh, mm-hmm. $4 million at auction, Ford GT, $4 million at auction, $4.4 million at auction. Like, So you go from these crazy expensive cars to not as crazy. Are you following the vehicle or following the event? We tend to do a little bit of both. Okay. So a good example would be we went down to um, uh, Scottsdale, Arizona, for the big auctions that happen every January. And we covered cars at Bear Jackson. We covered cars at uh, the Bonhams auction at, at RM Sotheby's. And that, um, uh, who was the other one? Was it Meekum? Uh, there was, 
Yeah. Well, no, not Mecham, because Mecham wasn't kissing me, but you're right. It was Mecham on the other side of the country. So we covered that one in addition. The idea being that we can pick and choose cars that actually matter to the market. We, you know, the people that I work with that do the, the market side of things, I, I was the auction editor over at Sports Car Market for a very long time. So I've tracked the market and I've I work with people that have tracked the market for a long time. We're able to pick and choose cars that are selling at auction that tell tell an actual story about what's happening in the market, you know, and, and the people that I work with know what they're looking at and they know when they see something that is noteworthy and, and means something. You know, it's not just picking a car that sold for a big number. It's it's picking a car to write about that it has changed since the last time we saw one in some kind of a significant way, so either then, up or down or, or whatever. So then let me ask you this. So you, I'm sure you very well aware of, of bring a trailer and how they've kind yeah. of changed the dynamic of uh, like how you sell your vehicle and how they editorialize mm-hmm. vehicles. That really wasn't done. I mean, we had I don't know, auto trader and all these, uh, you know, the places you buy cars, there's the nuts back and bolts, the but there's never the story behind there's it. There's no story. And yeah. then they That's kind cool. of made it a thing. It's right? because all the people on Craigslist started going viral with all their hilarious stories about the vehicles and people realized, holy crap, it's the story that sells. And w- is that on, how it happened? On the media side, we've known that forever. We know that it's all about the yeah. the, the narrative, <laughs> no, right? But, no, but did, did Bring a Trailer right. happen because I, of I, car? I don't know, but that's Craigslist? that's the that's the chronological order of what happened is you start getting those Craigslist, Craigslist ads going viral and all of a sudden now telling a story that goes along with the vehicle is suddenly an important part of the, of the car buying process. But like Bring a Trailer can anoint a vehicle and say, this is why this 91 Toyota pickup is well, worth this. Blah, to, blah, 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 blah. Today blah. they can. Today they can. They yeah. kind of did that right out of the gate, I thought. I thought they did that kind of right out of the gate. It was a blog that went around um, a small group of people that basically just tracked cars that they found online that were really interesting. It, it started out really just as a, a place for information. And it evolved into an auction after a number of years of just being, um, you know, an interesting place to go and, and spend some some coffee break time when you were at work. And they changed everything when they started their auctions. I mean, the, the entire auction world kind of got turned on its ear because all of a sudden you didn't have to ship your car, car across the country and, and run it across a block as your only option. I mean, eBay was also a thing, but but Bring a Trailer brought with it this this base of commenters that would weed out stuff that wasn't legit. And so it, it totally changed everything because it wasn't just auctions. It wasn't just cool cars. It was also social media based on people that knew what they were talking about and was self-policing. It was brilliant in what they did. And so, it, you know, it, it deserved to change the world in the way that it did because it was so special. But they gave us the roadmap for all the other auction houses to survive COVID because all of a sudden all these auctions couldn't host their events anymore because people couldn't be around each other. They all went online and they all tried to make something similar to what bring a trailer was doing. Some of them were successful and some of them weren't. Um, and some of them are still doing it. Some of them aren't, but it's, um, it's definitely a, a sea change, right? When that, when that launched it, it changed everything. So having attended so many of these auctions and to be honest with you, I think I've only attended one in my life. I've, I would love to attend them more, but is it about the car or is it more about the experience? Is it about showing off how much cash you have in front of other wealthy people? What's the dynamic at a Barrett Jackson or a Mecham? Well, every auction is different. Every auction um, location is different. Every auction company is different. Um, and it really depends on the cars that are being offered and and who's in the room to get them. Now, at a place like Barrett Jackson, I think there's definitely um, an aspect of people that want to to show up on TV that they're doing this and that they're buying a car. But at the same time, you can't just chalk up their numbers to that because they they continually break records and do what they do. Right. It keeps happening. You know, we talk about the truck world. I've been watching the truck values for the last decade. And every year I think, well, they're going to go back down. This was just a, you know, a flash in the pan kind of thing. People are going to come to their senses and trucks are going to go back to where they were. And it still hasn't happened. Why? Because the the demand is there. And I think that's what you see at a place like Bear Jackson. You're, you're seeing the demand. It's definitely a lifestyle experience when you go to a Bear Jackson auction. And I think Mecham is a lot like that. And, you know, the, the Mecham auctions that I've been to have been very much, um, I think, more about the cars than they are about the lifestyle. But there's a lot of that sort of same sort of stuff happening in both locations. 
And then when you go up into the the more boutique, smaller events like your RM Sotheby's or your Gooding Auctions or your Bonham Sales, those guys, they tend to have um, a very, very high level of car. Um, and you're talking like the bluest of blue chip cars and buyers, multi-million dollar cars going up for sale and, you know, people that know very, very well what they're buying and why they're buying it. Well, and I, I think even at some of the, let's say, middle range type of builds that, that go for big dollars out of Meekum or out of Barrett Jackson or some of these auctions, I think there's sort of the mystique of these vehicles are starting to become a little bit more rare on the open market. And the ones that are available mm-hmm. require a lot of work. And I think people are willing to pay a premium to have something done at at a level of quality, which would be hard for them to replicate for the same dollar amount if they don't, mm-hmm. you know, they may have the, the resources, but they may not have the time or they may not want to yeah. wait that long and they're willing to pay that premium. And I think as things become more scarce, you know, it's funny, we're looking at vehicles now that are probably in some places being redone for the third time. These are, you know, 50, 60 year old vehicles. Maybe they had a, a, a mild restoration in the 70s or, or 80s. And then maybe they had a rest mod in the 90s. And now, you know, mm-hmm. they want to do like a, a pro street tour or something like that, or pro tour or whatever. And maybe it was uh, the grandpa passed it down to the, the dad who passed it down to the son. And then, you know, their style is completely different, right? And they're, they want to do it in their own way, but it's the same truck. So we're starting to look at things that are being redone several times over because the supply in the world uh, is dwindling. And then also just the sentimental value is worth money to people. Yeah. And I think the the whole point about, buying one done versus having to go through the trouble of doing it yourself was laid bare in 2020, specifically at Barry Jackson. We saw numbers like we haven't ever seen on cars that were selling. And it was because the cars were done and you couldn't get parts. Yep. And you couldn't even get new cars all of a sudden. No, I mean, and people were like, well, you know, you only live once. Now's a chance to to buy the thing I've always wanted. And and I think we're seeing a lot of that in the market. People are still wanting that they're buying the things they've always wanted because they've always wanted it. And now's the time. And, for better or for worse, here we are. <laughs> what have you seen in the truck market that's absolutely floored you? I mean, have you seen a C10 or C20 just go for stupid numbers that oh, you just could You're like, who's buying this and why? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, just look at look at any of the auctions out of January from anywhere, not just Bear Jackson or Nikon, but any of the auction houses. There was one in particular that I looked over pretty closely at Bear Jackson um, simply because it was very close, at least fundamentally, to what I built in my own garage here with the, the book truck. I mean, admittedly, it had a much nicer paint job. The I'm sure everything was done to a higher level than, you know, your average garage guy like me. But here's this truck that's got the same suspension kit that I've got on mine, same brakes I've got on mine, I think. Um, it's an LS swap, just like mine is, and, and all of that good stuff. And it sold for $330,000. And this truck was on a factory frame. It wasn't even on a, you know, a, a a fancy pro touring chassis or anything like that. It was just really nicely done, but $330,000 of nicely done. I don't know. That's, that's nope. pushing it a little yeah. bit. A lot of coin yeah. or a nice house in a lot of places. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, think of the other things you could buy with that money, you know, <laughs> but to somebody that truck was exactly what they wanted and they weren't going to let it go. Well, and so, that's, that goes back to the old yeah. adage of how much is it worth? And it's whatever somebody's willing yeah. to pay. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, yeah. yeah. Hey, one of the stories on uh, LinkageMag.com, you're talking about the future of muscle. And I I don't want to talk about muscle cars. I'm going to dovetail off of this article because this is mainly about like the Mopar scene and what they're doing with electrics and such. But I wanted to twist this a little bit and ask you, what do you think the future is of the quote unquote muscle trucks, the Raptors, the TRXs? Mm -hmm. And where do you think we're going to go with the end of an era you know holman on the show if you've listened for any length of time you know he's been saying get your big v8 now because this is it this is the last two raw what's your take i feel the same way i think anything that's low production be it um anything that's been built for a specific purpose so your raptors your trx is that kind of stuff will be something people will covet if it's popular now it will be even more in the future so that is most certainly something to consider. I mean, if you're looking to buy something like this, I think you're right. You might be looking at your opportunity pretty soon because the world is changing. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to get worse or they're not. The new products aren't going to be great. It just means that they're different, you know, 
I was on a panel at Barrett Jackson this year, um, right before the auction, and we were talking about future collectibles, and, and we had to pick cars that we thought were going to be future collectibles. And one of the ones that I had on my list, I thought I was going to get run out of the building on this one, but I had on my list fifth gen Toyota 4Runners, simply because their body on frame SUVs, they're pretty simple underneath, you know, V6, automatic transmission, pretty straightforward, easy to come by now. But the world is shifting, and it's going to be hard to get something that's that basic. And, you know, yeah, every fourth car on the road is a forerunner, but it's not going to be that way forever. And also, that's the kind of thing that draw, I mean, usability and, and actual memory, use memory, is one of those things that drives people to want to get something back in the future. They, people collect what they know, right? And if they had a forerunner or they rode around in a lifted forerunner or something when they were younger, that's what they're going to want in the future. So for me, I think it really comes down to not just limited production, but also anything that is treated as a specialty vehicle. Because if you look back and try to list out the cars that are in the collector world now and the trucks that are in the collector world now, they're pretty much none of them are mundane. They're all special in some way, right? People aren't collecting Falcons, they're collecting Shelbys. And it's the same thing. It's, it's, it's all happened before, it's all going to happen again. And I, I, would, I would venture to say that the uh, the factory specialty vehicles are going to have more value. I mean, everybody has gone crazy with these resto mods, which make them a nicer daily. But that also means that the factory fresh ones or the low mileage ones or the ones that, you know, have been restored to a, a Pebble Beach style, those are going to be incredibly valuable because there's just real, there's even less of those. Because I think, you know, a lot of these trucks are survivors uh, or maybe mm-hmm. even close to going to the junkyard like mine was. So people aren't mm-hmm. afraid to rest a mod something like that because they're taking something that would have gone to the junkyard and and returning it to the road. But the number of vehicles yeah. that look like it did the day it rolled off the production line is is going to be microscopic in the next decade or yeah. two. Yeah, and one of the things that we, we touched on this a little bit with the book, with the both my books, with the history part that I have in the book, the specific reason that I included history in both cases was to try to make sure we pointed out the things that were rare or that were uncommon in the trucks that we're looking at specifically. So people maybe would think twice about messing up one that was special. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah. And, I, and that was always the, the battle with, you know, at the magazine with magazine projects is somebody would go, Oh, I can't believe you cut up that rare Jeep or whatever. And half the mm-hmm. staff would be like, well, it's mine. Who cares? And the other half uh, would be purists saying, well, now you've ruined it for the next generation. And, you know, with any luck, these vehicles outlast us. And you really have to look at it at that. We are just the people who have them in our care uh, for the, the amount yeah. of time they're with us. And hopefully they, they live on beyond us because it's, it really is a nod back to a time in, in history where industry and freedom kind of intersected, whereas today yeah. industry has moved on to other things and, and it's a lot harder to be free and do a burnout in the middle of the street or something like that without some camera capturing <laughs> you and you know some neighbor getting you on video or something and complaining to the cops. Or It just really reflects a period of time that I think is really special in car mm-hmm. culture and in American history in general. Yeah, and I think the, the key to all this is to make sure that the people coming up behind you, your kids or whoever they may be, gets the hands-on opportunity or at least the hands-on experience to um, to fall in love with these things the same way that that we did. Um, you know, I, I do my best to try to pick up my kids from school in the pickup when I can, right? In the in the C20 that I built, or in my first car, the '66 that's taken up half of my garage. Why? Because you know, there's going to be a day when I'm not around, but they're going to remember that car or that truck, and they're going to want to do the same thing. You know, to me, I tr- I just try to I share the things with them that I think are inter- interesting and that are special, and, and I hope that other people do the same thing because I think that's going to keep the hobby moving the way. That- so what I'm hearing you say is that uh, Chevy GMC trucks 67 to 1972 or Chevy GMC trucks 1973 to 1987 would make a great gift for a young car enthusiast in your life. (laughs) And you can go to cartechbooks.com to get yourself a copy. And Cartech was nice enough to give us a promo code to use. So the promo is Truck Show, which will give you 20% off any titles, not just gyms. So that's at checkout. And that's at checkout. And we will put that up on our uh, Truck Show Podcast uh, website on the uh, on the um, Truck Show Podcast. Page. Dot, yeah, truckshowpodcast.com is where you go to get that promo yep. code. Yep. Jim, congratulations on the books. These are phenomenal. 
And uh, like Holman said, these are great gifts or just be selfish and buy them for yourself. <laughs> Both books have their own uh, Instagram page. So Wait, what? At 67 underscore, 72 underscore, build underscore, and underscore modify. Uh-huh. Or at 73 underscore, 87 underscore, build underscore, and underscore modify on Instagram. And then, Jim, if they wanted to follow you, do you have an Instagram uh, that they could find you at? Yep, I'm Pick Jim. P-I-C-K underscore J-I-M. Pick, on, and that's pick, on Instagram. You said Pick Jim. Pick Jim. Big Jim, that's me. I feel like that's a, a political like action, like a button, right? You wear on your <laughs> call, call to action. You call to action Pick like, Jim. Pick Jim. <laughs> when I moved to Beaverton, I'm picking Jim. All right. Well, uh, on, on this podcast, uh, for this interview, we pick Jim. We do. <laughs> All right, Jim. Appreciate your time, and uh, and thanks so much for the insight and the conversation. No, oh, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. You got it. Thanks, Jim. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. I don't know when the last time we gave you an intro, but it's it's time, I think. All right, I'll uh, I'll take it, I guess. Where is that? I've got four big tires and some beadlock wheels. I've got four big tires and some beadlock wheels. I've got four big tires and some beadlock wheels. Hmm. You were in uh, Moab, which is in, uh, is that uh, western Utah? No, nope. northern Utah? Southeastern Utah. South, I was wrong twice. Really close, really close. <laughs> At least you had Utah right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I went out to uh, Easter Jeep Safari, and uh, it was a super, super busy week, and didn't get uh, any audio, but I thought I would just walk through some of the things and tidbits I picked up from there. So before you get into what you did there, Holman, there are some listeners that probably don't know what Moab is. Can you describe the landscape? It's a uh, mecca for off-roaders. It's a giant red rock valley with uh, uh, sandstone cliffs and trails, and it's amazing, and it's basically a mecca for off-roading, although... Uh, I'm, Moab, I gotta, dis, I gotta say, I'm a little bit disappointed with you now. They've been doing this event, the Red Rock Four Wheel Drive Club, for the last 50 years, and uh, or or maybe even more. And uh, Moab is growing up. There's all these hotels now. It's getting blown out. I've been going for about 20 years, and it's just not how it used to be. And then all you guys out there with your 40s and 42s are tearing up the trail. It's not that much fun on 37s anymore because everything's so dug out from these big tires and things like that. And it's Got to be honest, it's starting to, uh, starting to lose a little bit of luster for me. Well, is, is it become like a party that happens to just have some off-roading? No. Or no. is it still about the No, it's all about the off-roading. Okay. Yeah, basically you get there on uh, Friday or Saturday. I camped with uh, Matt Felderman from AEV and Nick Somas from Peak Suspension. We drove out, caravaned out, camped Friday night out by St. George. Uh, it was awesome. There's a video that... Uh, Peak suspension put out. I may make a cameo in the background peeing while he's interviewing uh, Nick on there, which is probably hilarious to some of you. Oh, so that's not the video that I put up with him on the Bangs channel with him uh, installing the pedal monster. Uh, that's a different uh, video. Uh, you unless, unless I was in the background of that <laughs> one as well, <laughs> relieving myself in the wilderness. Uh, so anyway, yeah, you get there, you know, on the weekend, and everybody has a bunch of trails. There's a bunch of corporate parties and stuff in the evenings, and then the last couple of days of Friday and. Uh, Thursday and Friday is the arena where there's a big vendor show and all that, and then people usually skedaddle out of there uh, prior to Easter. And it's just a big wheeling party, and there's probably 10,000 Jeeps in town, and it's probably the only place where you don't have to wave at every Jeep because you would just constantly have your hand up, so people don't expect it there. Has it become too corporatized? No, it's not corporate at all for the most part. Um, it's just it's busy, and if I get the vibe that some of the businesses don't really like you. Don't really want the off-roaders there, even though it's most of their, uh, probably the majority of their income for the year, or a quarter of it, probably. But, like, if you're a business, it's been going on for 50 years. Yeah, like get over a it. Lot of, I know, there's just a lot of people that move there. That's like I, buying a house next to an airport. Airport complaining and they, about yeah, it. Yeah, and then complaining yeah. about the airport. Like, dude, it was here 40 years ago. That's, Stop bitching. Yeah, that's just how, mm-hmm. how it is. So, um, there's certain businesses in town that have always been pro-off-road, and they remain pro-off-road, like the Moab Diner, and Zach's Pizza, and... and uh, places like that but uh i don't know it just it's just the the vibe there is changing it's it's our, our little moabs growing up and it's just not as uh i don't know not as it used to be it's not bad it's not good it's just not what it used to be but fortunately get out of town the trails the ones that they <laughs> the blm hasn't tried to close down uh are still great and there's still a lot of uh, fun out there so a couple things happened one was i had a chance to have dinner with the new head of jeep north america so uh, you know that our friend Jim Morrison, a uh, friend of the show, who's been on a bunch of times, he's moved over and he's now running Jeep Performance Parts. 
And uh, Bill Pfeffer, who uh, came over from Maserati, he was at Kia, some other places. Uh, they had a very tight meeting with journalists or he, he could meet like the off-road folks and had a dinner with him and got to meet him. And one of the things he said in that, that actually a couple things came out of that meeting. Uh, this is at the dinner? This is at the dinner and yeah. at the, the meeting prior to the dinner. One of the things that were interesting is he said that uh, Jeep is finally absorbing the Wagoneer brand. So now be Jeep Wagoneer. Before it was a sub brand, it was just sort of on its own at a Jeep dealership. It was. And there was no Jeep branding anywhere on the vehicle except for like inside the headlights and at the base of the windshield. There, everything else said Wagoneer, Grand Wagoneer. So now it'll be Jeep Wagoneer and Jeep Grand Wagoneer the way it should I have been all along. I did not know that. And you, that's not an uncommon thing. Most people are like, hey, that looks like a Jeep. Well, it's a Wagoneer. Where do I get one? Jeep dealer. Well, it's, I thought you said it wasn't a Jeep, right? It's the same thing as Ford wants what? to have a Raptor sub brand and Ford's trying to have a Mustang sub brand and, and Chevrolet's talked about a Corvette sub brand or a Camaro sub brand that was all the rage in the oe world for a while and it's stupid so stop doing that and jeep is bringing wagoneer back in well, they don't even great. have to bring it back in it's already there it's the perception that it's well so anyway the perception of- and reality will will finally uh, match each other on that the other thing that he said is that he recognizes the fact that off-roading is probably going to be a little bit slower to adopt this full ev thing and as the company is going you know hardcore into ev he was talking about that Jeep will have ice longer and have a diversification of driveline, which I think you're seeing a little bit with Dodge and the new uh, the Charger coming out, where it's going to be available with the, the Hurricane in it, the straight six. And it will uh, be EV or it'll be ice. I think you'll see that with some Jeep products coming out. So that was nice to hear. And then uh, our friend Jim Morrison caused a little bit of a viral um, explosion in Moab. Really? Good or bad? He brought out a 4xE, and on the hood said Hurricane 500 on it. And all these people started taking oh, pictures no. and blowing they up the- They thought it was a 500 horsepower hurricane in it? They thought it was the straight six. So everybody freaked out and was like, that's the straight six, that's the straight- Well, what you don't realize is the four-cylinder is also called Hurricane. And Jeep Performance Parts is working on a 50 state emissions tune that would bring around 500 horsepower and 500 pound-feet of torque to the four-cylinder. And that's what he was promoting with that, except everybody on the trail thought it was the straight six. And I think I've said on the show before, the straight six does not fit. All of you people who think the hurricane is coming to the jail, it's not coming to the jail. Why are they, why'd they name it the same thing? It's the same engine family. One's just a four cylinder, one's a six cylinder. I get that, but okay, well, there's the confusion. I mean, when you name it the same thing, that's that's what you're going to get. But it's the, it's just, it's the same engine family. It's just one's no different than the Mercedes and... All those were the V6, V8s, or the four-cylinder straight sixes. Went viral. Everybody was saying, oh, it's finally here. Guys, the Hurricane is two or three inches too long. The JL just had its mid-cycle refresh. There's only four or five years left for that platform. They're not going to spend two years getting it shoehorned in there, changing the body, getting it recrashed, all the things that have to happen. It's not happening. So just I'm telling you right now, <laughs> it's not happening. So wow. the, the, the look of frustration on your face, oh. and you're, not, you're only talking to me. Well, and, I feel like you're standing in front of an auditorium well, right now expressing this uh, and, and, disdain to everyone. And Jim was telling me that all these people were coming up to him on the trail, and he goes, yeah, we might have to rename it, but it was a great conversation starter. He goes, all these people wanted to know, and then when I told them what it was, they were like, oh, that's still cool. So the 500-500-ish is with a hybrid. It's a little bit less without the electric motor giving it the boost. So that's going to be really cool. He's doing some really cool things at JPP that I think are going to be really, really rad. Jeep performance parts. Yeah, so think about Mopar for Jeeps, essentially. That was really cool. Um, and then he brought out a bunch of vehicles and we went over some of it. Well, did you get, wait, stop. You don't blow past the Hurricane 500. Did you get a chance to go in it? I did not get a chance to drive it. No, oh, this sucks. was just a development kind of a teaser. Okay. Uh, got a chance to see it. There's a bunch of things that he's working on. Can't talk about all of them yet, but there's some really cool things coming out of JPP where it won't uh, be the afterthought maybe it has been to this point. Uh, Embargo. One of the vehicles I got to drive was the Gladiator with the 2-inch Mopar slash JPP kit. It used to have aluminum foxes on it. They switched over to Bill Stein 5160s, Hmm. and it was phenomenally better in terms of ride. I took it on the trail. No more head toss. Really, like, nice and stable and flat while still being compliant. And I think people who are trying to decide, because right now there's a lot of the Fox kits that are still on the shelves and the Bill Stein kits are just hitting. We talked about it before when that press release came out, uh, I think toward the end of last year, but I hadn't driven one. And I'm like, yeah, it'll probably be better. It's like way better. Do they change sway bars as well, stuff like that? Or is it just shocks? It's just shocks. Okay. Yeah, wow, really? So that made that big a difference? He, massive, massive difference. And mm-hmm. so they worked really hard on the tune on that with our friends over at Bill Stein. And I got to tell you, it's, it's, it's phenomenal. 
that kit is one I would recommend now to somebody yeah. because before it was like mm, it felt felt like it was half baked to be honest like it just didn't feel like it was fully I don't know fully hatched in in my opinion and then just threw shocks yeah, on just and, the way it rode and things like that it was just kind of like a eh, meh like okay cool you offer that put in your your payment whatever now I think somebody gets it they're gonna be really happy with that so so that was a really cool uh, <laughs> sucks for those people who yeah. bought the old one the other thing Jeep brought out is you can finally get from the factory for the first time ever a two-door Wrangler with a 35XR package on it. A two-door Wrangler with a 35XR? It was awesome. 35-inch tire package. Okay. Phenomenal on a two-door. Looked so great. I drove it. Needs about an inch more of up travel just because you're on the jounces and stuff with those big tires. But I've got to tell you, that thing was awesome. It went over everything. There's like almost no breakover angle, no approach angle, no departure angle. It's just fun to drive. You can squeeze it through stuff. You drove over stuff. It just didn't care. Does it turn on a dime? It turns on a dime. It stops on a dime. Like, I would honestly be like, just for like a city runabout, that thing would be so much fun. Be so much fun. And so you can get that now um, starting in 24. And you get all the niceties with the new dash and the giant screen and all that. And What is it um, called? Is there a name for it or no? It's just a two-door Wrangler Rubicon, but you can get the 35-inch tire package on it. Oh, okay. So, okay. so go do that thing. If you're going to get one of those and you don't want to lift it, Get that and be incredibly happy and just rock on because it's so cool. Does it come with the Hurricane 500 badging on the hood? It does not. It says ah. Rubicon because Hurricane 500 is not out yet. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, I also had a chance to uh, get behind the wheel of the uh, the concepts that were unveiled out at the 2024 uh, Easter Safari. And so they had four this year. One was a redo of the Wagoneer that had that really cool red tail carbon fiber rooftop tent. They kind of freshened that one up. So that was cool, but it, we've seen that one before. It used to be tan. It was out at uh, the OVR display at LA Auto Show, if you went out to there. Now it's uh, mint green with a white roof and uh, just some changes on the interior. just freshens it up. Hey, do they, when, when they do a color change on those trucks, are they wraps or are they actually painting them? No, they're painting them. Oh, wow. No, they're, it's, a, it's a full blow it apart and uh, put it back together. Uh, they had this thing called the... Uh, Jeep Willie's Dispatcher concept, which uh, was also kind of a seafoam green, and it was designed to be kind of a mix of new and old. It had like really flat bumpers on it, a worn 8274 uh, winch on it, so definitely old school, big square bumpers, uh, steely wheels, uh, mud terrain, super traction tires to give that old school vibe. And but it's still a modern four by e drivetrain, and it was cool. It was just yeah, it, I don't know how I feel about that mint color, but yeah. I do like the the setup. I, and to go back thirty seconds, you said Willys, but didn't you correct me and say it's Willis? It's well, it should be pronounced Willis. Nobody pronounces it that way, but okay. the uh, the ones in the know Willis is the correct. So the other cool thing that this had is an embossed uh, hood graphic. So instead of just stickers on the hood. It says Willie's on the hood, which is cool. So, oh, it's stamped. Yeah, it has that embossed vibe to it, like a tailgate or vintage tailgate, something like that. So that was kind of cool. I wouldn't be surprised if you saw some of these design things, like uh, the bright color with a black windshield frame, uh, come into some of the future designs. If you know the history of these concepts and you know what to look for, a lot of these things end up in uh, in production. Then the other thing that they had there, which was interesting, was the Jeep Gladiator Rubicon high top. And these were on the very... First set of 40-inch BF Goodrich KO3 all-terrain tires. Uh, right now, you will be able to get them for uh, certain packages on the GM full-size trucks, as well as the Ranger Raptor, but they're not in the aftermarket yet. There's a big launch coming later this year. I'm sure we'll cover it here on the podcast. In fact, there are a lot I, of people looking forward to those KO3s. Massive. They've been 10 years since they had they got redesigned. It's still one of the better tires on the market. The KO2's been around for over 10, 10 years. 10 years. Over 10 years. So the cool thing about the, uh, the new KO3 is it's everything you loved about the KO2, with some tweaks to make it a little bit of a, a tougher, uh, better tire with weather, better wearing, less chunking, things like that. So uh, super excited. I can't wait to finally drive them. I, they're going to be coming out in size tranches, so I don't know what size are available. BFG has been super tight-lipped, but I found the right people in Moab. We're going to try and get them on the show to talk about the new tire. Um, they also have that new HD terrain, which is like a load range F. Uh, made for big trucks with 40s to have the trailer and payload. Really? And those things have been doing really well, too. So I want to have somebody from BFG to come on to talk about both, both of these tires. Ooh, it's going to be tough getting me out of Toyos, but I'm, uh, I'll listen. Toyos is a great tire. Um, I've, I've been really happy with those. I've been happy with the BFGs. But still, all around, if I had one tire to do everything, the KO2s to this point would be that. Really? I'm hoping KO3s are the, uh, are the successor to that. There have been a lot of great changes in the marketplace. I mean, uh, Falcon just came out with their new AT4, uh, 
And you've got their RT. You got Toyo's RT uh, Trail. We just got, put I mean, uh, the Falcon RTs on uh, Brian Shaw's World's Strongest yeah. Man on his great, uh, great 2000, 2002 excursion. Yeah. What a gorgeous excursion! You're going to see the video on Banks Channel soon. His seventh year excursion is just gorgeous. Just shipping it back to him tomorrow to Colorado. Nice. But uh, yeah, those are yes. Yeah, so big shout to Falcon for supplying those tires. There, the, he was so stoked. So the other cool thing about the Gladiator Rubicon high top concept is the fact that it had air suspension on it. So it had the uh, the Accu Air no airbags. kidding. I've been seeing a few more of those pop up here and there, yep. but I think a lot of people are hesitant. They're I'm you know, not real, a fan. Real? Oh, you're not I, of airbags. Oh, no, no, now, I know Accu that. AccuAir but... makes a great product, and I've yeah. heard a lot of good things about this particular kit. But you haven't used it yet. But I haven't used it yet. This was the only concept I ran out of time to get the drive, so I haven't been in it yet. But we know the guys over there, so hopefully I can get into it, uh, something with it at, at some point. I don't necessarily like air because as it goes up in temperature, the spring rate changes. Also, if you have a bag failure... How does it fail? Does it fail up? And the closed loop system is an open loop and it fails down and now you don't have ground clearance. Your tires are rubbing on your body. Those are the things to worry about. Although I haven't heard of any issues like that with this system. People say it's pretty crazy. It's about six inches, I think, of, of, of adjustability. And uh, I know a couple of people who did some durability tests and they were really happy with it. But still, for what I do, where I go way out, I don't need any of that kind of tech for me personally. I want steel spring and I don't want to have to worry about a blowing a bag or any of that kind of stuff. It would be super cool to have this uh, if you had a small garage like I do. Well, it would be super cool. Su- you could squat it and roll it in. Well, it would be super cool to have it, too, if you had a lot of payload and you need to level the vehicle out and all that, too. So there's definitely benefits to it. I just need to spend some more time with it. And then the uh, my personal favorite, uh, a nod to the end of the 392, is the Jeep Lowdown concept. And uh, that thing was freaking awesome. 392 on 42-inch BFG crawlers. Dana axles, all the good stuff. So it's this really uh, pretty red color, like a ruby red, and it had brilliant pearl white accents on it with like a racer-inspired 392 logo and badging on it. And then they used a red welding curtain for the top for oh, shade. <laughs> that's kind of cool. And they took off the bumpers. It's got these big-ass you know uh, wheels on it. It wasn't lifted, so it definitely needed some up travel. Are those like 22s? What's on that? Uh, I believe huge. I believe that's a f- uh, 42 inch crawler on a 20 on a 20. Yeah, mm. so it was uh, pretty awesome. And then they did like an embossed uh, Jeep on the tailgate. No spare. Well, you don't see like big five spoke like KMC looking uh, 20s in a 40. You said 42. This is a 42. Yeah, that's that's cool looking. Looks awesome. And then I love the interior because the seats had like the racing style uh, like grommets in it, and it just was. Just awesome. I drove that thing around. And it was like, man, this thing is so stupidly fun. I like the uh, dashboard. It's got a big 392, like a uh, yep. racing lettering yep. font. And then the this is a nod to the lower 40, which was the famous concept that was 40-inch uh, tires on a uh, JK. So this was sort of like, nod to that. What would it be as a JL? What would it be as a 392? So overall, pretty rad. Did you get a chance to drive it? I did, and I, I didn't want to get out of it. No. And then I remember, well, you oh, like I have one of these. Yours? Well, no, I mean, it, I, it's it's cool. Everybody's in line for that thing. I, and the driving experience, you know, wasn't that much different than mine. And I got in mine, I was like, oh, yeah, I own one of these. I get to go home in it. So. Yeah, but the tires and the, yeah, uh, I mean, the axles. It just looks cool. Other, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't want it as a daily driver. You couldn't park it anywhere. You know, it didn't have, it was a concept. So while it's drivable, the, the steering was reduced quite a bit so it wouldn't rub. And, you know, you go to turn, you're like, oh, <laughs> this is like 30%, re- you know, reduced steering. Um you know, and it's half doors and open to the elements. It's just a fun toy, but uh, not not a great daily. But as a dream vehicle, yeah, that thing would be super rad. So anyway, that was uh, just a brief overview of my week in uh, Moab. And I received many, many ducks on my Jeep, which is... Yeah, what's all that about? Why were there little, uh, those squeak, those yellow squeak ducks It's just everywhere? a Jeep thing. What is that about? It, somebody likes your Jeep, they leave you a rubber duck. I know why. Uh, somebody, I believe she was from Canada... Started it like 10 years ago and uh, just caught on as a thing. And uh, listener uh, Jason Broom, uh, if you guys have seen, I, we may have put, even put it on the truck show reels, the Whittle Watter. Yeah. Uh, he 3D printed a Whittle Whittle Watter and put magnets on and then stuck it to the side of my Jeep. Yeah. Oh, no, you can yeah. buy those. Uh, they're off Instagram. Yeah. Oh. You can buy those yeah, he, Whittle Watters. He made a Whittle Watter for uh, for my- I saw uh, it st- stuck onto the back, uh, your back door. So the, uh, the the body on those things are aluminum, but the rear corners are, uh, are steel. steel. So yeah. I walk out and he's like snickering. <laughs> 
So, anyway. But it's not right. I mean, you put a little Widowatter on a Toyota. That's what all the Widowatters are on. But, but that's why it was funny, because he was like shaming my Jeep by having a Widowatter, which is you would normally see on a Toyota. So you got it. two ducks and a Widowatter. No, no, I got seven ducks. You got seven ducks? Seven ducks. So that, those are compliments, but still like, what, now yeah. what do you do with the ducks? Do you re-gift them? Uh, I don't. I have them on my workbench. There's just like 30 ducks up there that I've gotten over the years. But it feels like you should pass it along I, and pay it forward. I know, but I, maybe I should. But You I, should. I have a thing about touching other people's vehicles, and I don't want to, and a lot of people hate the you, ducks. But you're not, oh, do they? Yeah, oh, yeah. There's, there's two massive contingents. It's the I hate ducks and I love ducks. I personally, kind of in the middle, don't care. Like, it's nice that somebody left you something because they think you have a pretty awesome Jeep. But on the other hand, you're, you have a bunch of kids bath toys in your Well, Jeep, who the so. hell is, again, walk around with bags and bags of ducks? Like, oh, someone raided the Dollar Tree, you, you know what I'm saying? Well, they've jumped the shark now because now you can buy Jeep ducks. A lot of companies there have their logo on ducks, and that's, you can get them that no, way. No, that's whack. No, that's that's how it is. And so, no, I'm saying it's, it's that's dumb. That's now that, yeah, yeah. They, 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 Once it's gone corporate, it's over. They've jumped the shark. So yeah. there are literally people that have ducks, and now the thing is, all sorts of ducks. There's holiday ducks and and bath ducks. And no, so then when Jeep it's going to go like little dinosaurs for like a, a TRX or. You know, it's going to go to a little raptor, you know. Yeah, the Bronco just, guy, yeah. somebody started something. I can't remember, remember what it is, but it's some other thing. Yeah, the Bronco no, guys. Yeah. Right, those time, weirdos time, are doing. Time to stop people. Yeah, yeah. Stop leaving little plastic toys on people's cars, I guess. All right, let's uh, change gears and hit some email. You email? Yeah. I email. Do it. We email. That's right. Everybody email. Type it up. You email. Proofread. I can't help but think that uh, that one guy that left us the, uh, the one star the, review. The one star review. He's like, oh, sounds like a stupid FM morning show. Bunch of dorks. Did that ever make it? Because uh, last time I checked, it wasn't up. And I don't know if it got flagged and taken down. We didn't I, I, I don't know. But uh, I just think, like, man, would would we have even more listeners if we ditched the, the silly jingles and stuff? Or do you think, no. it, what, does this make it? Why would I? Does it make it feel like us? I didn't do this show for other people. I did the show for me and you. Well, clearly, the lack of revenue shows that. <laughs> well, yeah. So, like, we just do it because it's fun. And if people want to come along for the ride, then we welcome you to join our wackiness. I think it's fun. And if you have kids, they think it's fun. So, that's what I care about. Uh, pizza debate. Subject line from uh, Jake Palmgren. So, he says, tomato cake! <laughs> With three exclamation marks. Yeah, sorry, Chicago, New York style. Pizza is real pizza. Jake Prius. <laughs> nice, because I screwed up his uh, name once. No, he yeah. did. You know, he put Jake, but he didn't put his last name, so he yeah. just made it up. Jake Prius. No, I think he oh, drove a Prius, and you made fun of him, so he just said. No, that. no, no, no. It wasn't. It was Jake P, and I didn't know what his name was. Oh, so so I you said Jake, Jake Prius. Prius. I just yeah. made it up, and it pissed him off. All right, I got this one from Tommy Harrell. Says, uh, "Podshed guys, Lightning needs a headache rack on his pickup. It would be impossible for anyone to crawl in with the expanded metal flat bar round tube covering the back of the cab." Bonus, he can haul lumber longer than six foot without dropping the tailgate. I have multiple flatbed pickups with headache racks and frequently park with the slider open during summer. Birds, cats, and squirrels might make it inside, but not people. Side bonus, when you're loading up fence posts or firewood, you just chuck it without worrying about busting the glass. Tommy, and I thought about that and went, why didn't we think of headache racks? No, you could do a sporty one. Because I have four other windows that can be broken. So, which I've seen. If those you ones on, aren't on back order. If you go on, those YouTube, aren't on back order. Weird. I don't know that because I haven't tried to order one. They're yet. not on back order. But I've already seen two TRXs with the back passenger side windows broken, and they're not on back order. Well, I don't know that. Neither do you. Do You're we need to call Mike that. Rice to find out? Call him. He's not going to know offhand. He might. You think so? He's probably drinking whiskey right now. Let's find out. What's up? Mike Rice, Lightning and Home and Truck Show podcast. We have a question for you. Oh, by the way, Mike Rice oh, works boy, at Adventure Off Road in Huntington Beach. Uh, yeah, and, and a uh, Jeep Ram dealer. <laughs> hey, uh, so here's the deal Lightning's uh, TRX almost got stolen, and so his uh, rear glass got broken. That's how he got in. And so it's on back order, as you know. And so he's like, blah, 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 can't drive my TRX. So our listener says, hey, you should put a headache rack on that thing, and then they can't break that little window in the back. And Lightning's like, no, because I have four other windows. By the way, he has five. That they could break into. They're not going to go through the windshield. They might. No. And I'm like, dude, listen. That back 
left or right rear window is not on back order like the slider. He goes, you don't know that. I'm like, let's call Mike Rice. Mike, is the back window on back order? The side ones. The side ones, actually, yes. We had to find <laughs> one for my other customer's stolen TRX at another dealership. They did break the side window. No, the headache rack will not stop your problems. Oh, boo. All right. Well, you just inflated lightning <sighs> Sorry, ego again. You didn't inflate my ego. I'm just saying, like, it's if just... If they want it, they'll get it. They're going to... Oh, you have six other windows. Moonroof. Rappel down to that sucker. I, I don't... <sighs> I don't know that they're going to break a window that they don't think if can they be want replaced it, they're gonna, easily. They're going to take it. Well, listen. Well, they can't the, replace the rear well, one easily. The, here's the thing, though: the customers that you know that have had their trucks stolen have yes. have the theft devices. Oh, let me, let me rephrase that because they haven't had them stolen if they if the theft devices worked. What's your experience been on on, on thwarting thieves? Like like have any of your customers figured out a way to keep the thieves from breaking in? Nobody has stopped them from breaking in. Lightning, your truck is the only one I know that actually hasn't been stolen. Uh, another customer of mine was stolen, but they recovered it from a hidden GPS. Probably three others have been stolen, never to be seen again. All right. So should we run my stickers by Mike? Yeah. So, Go Mike, I, I had these uh, die-cut vinyl stickers made for me, and, and I was going to place one of them on the back window of the truck in hopes – that in the one to two seconds that they're taking the car cover off and they read it, they they have some they take pause. You can, you're assuming they can read. Thank you. I'm I'm just I, no. He's assuming that I'm his they, giant yeah. die cut stickers will hold the glass shards together. I think they can read because they're holding tablets in most of the videos I've seen, and they need to understand CAN bus and they need to understand programming. So I think they can read. All right, they're not. They, they got right. to understand. Would you just read the stickers? Listen, First, enough, enough monkeys with enough typewriters will get Shakespeare eventually. I don't think your stickers are going to help. The first one says, "Break glass, make noise." The uh, sec- you the, should the, buzz that one. Okay, really? You, no. I, I don't want it. No, no, because people are still going to weigh in. They're All right, still going to call Mike? And weigh in. Mike, you should buzz it for Mike. He doesn't like it. Oh, Mike, yes or no? Break, break glass, On make the noise. Stickers? Yeah. First one is break glass, yeah. make noise. Okay, what's the next one? Key pairing mode disabled, which is how they uh, break in or how they drive it away because they uh, put in key pairing mode and they fake a key and the truck thinks it's theirs and they drive it away. The next one is do not break glass, straightforward. The next one is security protected. Doesn't okay. even make sense. I would say... I would say, if any of them, option B, key pairing mode disabled. Okay, the next one, vehicle does not run. All right. The well, next it is one. a Stellantis product. So <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> the next one is IGLA protected, and that is my, uh, uh, my CAN bus protection device. Um, well, I don't know if I'd advertise it, because if they figure out how to get around it at some point, then we'll right. know. Okay, all right. And then how about... Uh, Vehicle under surveillance, and the last. Yeah, they're not going to care. And the <laughs> yeah, exactly. And the last one that Holman likes, thieves will be shot. I mean, that's what I would put on my truck. But you know. <laughs> so the only thing that I worry about that one is that I, a guy down the street, I was uh, he drives just bought a brand new twenty three. Camaro SS. And I stopped by on my little scooter one day and said, hey, love the car. He was working on in the garage. Young dude. Since like mid-20s or something. Super stoked. Most expensive car he ever bought. And I go, hey, I drive the truck, uh, the TRX down the street. And he goes, oh, you're the one that got it broken into. He already heard from the neighbors. And I go, you need you need this IGLA device, blah, blah, blah. And, we start, and he said, oh, well, let me show you this video from about six streets over. And it was uh, a Hellcat. And one, it was from the ring camera footage. And you had a perfect view of the car. You had one guy breaking in to the driver's side. It was nose out facing the street in, the, in his uh, driveway. One guy breaking into the vehicle and another guy that helping him standing with a pistol in his hand with the pistol facing the front door. The guy couldn't start it. The guy in the car finally walked away. The guy with the pistol put it in his pocket and finally jetted after like four or five minutes. The whole time the guy was breaking in, the dude was pointing the gun at the front door of the house. Which is why you should always point back. 
So I'm just saying, like, well, d- it kind of scares me to run a sticker doesn't, like doesn't that. Doesn't our current POTUS advocate for shooting through doors? <laughs> <laughs> I'd all jokes aside, like, <laughs> like I, well, I like that sticker, but, like, does that actually get me shot? Like, I don't even know. I mean, you've lived no, a pretty good life to this point. Listen, we love our cars. We love our cars, but... You know, it, it's it would be a messy cleanup for either direction, and it's no car's really worth that. Well, listen to Mike voice a reason. Okay, well, uh, we now know from Mike Rice that uh, putting a sticker on the back window is questionable, and they uh, are also out of the windows. All <laughs> for so, no matter what window gets broken on my truck next, I'm host. I think you should just uh, have one of your friends with a CNC machine make billet aluminum window replacements. Why don't you just put those little cages around the windows like the UN does on trucks? <laughs> oh, no, no. Wrought Ro- iron bars like all the ghetto houses. Yeah, there you go. That's it. That's I what I'm going to do. Just like cartel trucks. Exactly. Just weld steel plates to it. <laughs> all right, Mike. We'll Thanks, talk Mike. You. Thank you. See ya. Gentlemen, a pleasure as always. All right. All right, talk to you soon. <laughs> See ya. Bye. Oh, we didn't ask what he was drinking. Uh, Damn, we'll find out. I'll, I'll ask him tomorrow. All right, I uh, got this one from our buddy Colby White. says, uh, Lightning's TRX problem solved. I was recently watching a movie when I suddenly had an idea that I think is perfect for keeping Lightning's TRX in the driveway. Here's the rough design. Uh, it appears to be a high-voltage fence and designed to keep large animals inside an, an enclosure. <laughs> so I think it would be perfect for, for keeping bad guys away from your truck. You Do that even... in Jurassic Park. <laughs> That's Come a screenshot. On. You can even put a sign like this one on Amazon that says, Danger Restricted Area High Voltage 10,000 Volts with the uh, T-Rex crossed out on it. Funny, because you have a yes. TRX. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, it seems like it does a good job of keeping things in, so why wouldn't it keep things out? Good luck, Colby White. <laughs> I mean, I appreciate That's the creativity. That funny. might be a little difficult to pull off. All right, yeah. well, it's still funny. Uh, another one, TRX rear window from uh, uh, Texas Trevor Lightning. Have you thought about getting a Lexan rear window made? You're in California, so you can probably find some uh, race shop or old school glass shop to make it for you. Uh, it's not a bad idea. Hmm. I'm I I and I don't they're know. just pushing out a piece of Lexus yeah, instead I of mean, your shattering your window. I don't know how you keep it. You just kick it in. So yeah, yeah I don't mm-hmm. I don't know. It's mm-hmm. novel idea. I don't know that it will work. Uh, Kobe White returns with Lightning's TRX problem solved part two. Uh, so never mind on the whole electric fence thing. Uh, I finished watching the movie. It didn't work out so hot for those people. Uh, but maybe you could get Igla to display this on the screen and have it say ah ah ah. Uh, you didn't say the magic word when somebody tries to take your truck without the code, and it's uh, Newman from Seinfeld. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, funny. Uh, Jeffrey Brown, subject line, Frontier Spotting. Lightning and Holman. I saw these two Frontiers right next to each other the other day at work. Sure wish my daily looked something like this. Can I get some stickers now? Just kidding. I got some of the first batch that were sent out. So, Holman, if you look closely, those are two Airliners. Yep. Frontier Jets. Yep. <laughs> Frontier Airlines. That's funny. That doesn't really That's not, count. Doesn't count. No, Jeffrey. Because that is a brand of airline, not funny. a <laughs> Nissan. Oh, rip that one into pieces. I <laughs> uh, got this one here from Trevor Nemero, Lightning's truck. Genuinely sorry you had to go through the attempted theft, Lightning. Screw thieves. Now I have something to make you feel better. Way back in my dad's day, he was big into Porsche. And was the proud owner of an old Otis Chandler 1974 911 with a beautiful wide body race trim all decked out. It was his pride and joy. One day or night when he was attending USC, someone tried to steal it but couldn't figure out the kill switch. So instead, they beat it with a crowbar, poured sugar in the gas tank. He oh. got it fixed but then eventually sold it because of the paranoia and my own damn birth. Uh, I guess babies don't do well in race cars. You're welcome for introducing those fears into you, but just think of the joys you can have reminding your kids for decades. Quote, unquote, did you lock the door? Are you sure? Let me check. That's from our friend Trevor. <laughs> what a dick. <laughs> Man, that uh, that's things. I, I, I mean, that's the whole thing like a rich kid going to a, you know, a, a nice school and yeah. I, I don't know, like trying to break into it is still something inside and they get pissed off with the sugar in the yeah, gas tank and all this. That doesn't feel like Someone who wants to steal the vehicle. A lot of effort. They're just trying to mess with you. A lot of effort. Leon Miller writes, Frontier Spotted in the Wild. Hey, guys, love the show. I'm uh, one of the new listeners from last year and can't stop listening. Welcome. I'm a truck driver of the 18-wheel variety, and your show gave me some insights into looking for my first new truck. 
I saw a frontier in the wild and managed to snap a photo. Also, my favorite episode, of course, is the Iowa 80 Truck Stop Show. Spent many visits there over the past few years. The fried chicken at the buffet is a must-have. And Leon gives his address, and this will be a pleasure sending you uh, some Truck Show Podcast stickers, Leon. Uh, I think my wife has taken over that duty. And Leon closes the email with, love the show, taste the biscuits, <laughs> parameters, and the embargo. Taste the biscuit. Taste the goodness of the biscuit. Master, monitor, key, engine, parameters. Embargo. All right, so our buddy Ray, who formerly uh, proposed the retractable bullards in your driveway, mm-hmm. is now coming with a new idea. He uh, is full of ideas. The Denver boot. So Ray says... Wait, uh, is that the big yellow thing that clamps on yeah, the Yeah, like wheels? the parking people. Oh, jeez. So he says, clearly Jay's not keen on my retractable bowler suggestion and was lukewarm on Sean's suggestion of a low wrought iron sliding fence. So how about putting on a Denver boot at night? You could even use it wherever you park during the day to be extra safe. Even if they don't make those wheel locks large enough for the TRX wheels and body clearance, Jay has all that engineering talent and solid works at Banks to slap out a design doing a bit of night weekend work. It's all a ginormous pain, I know, but better than losing such a great truck and one worth so much dough. And that's from our friend Ray. Ray, that's actually not a bad idea. My concern with that uh, style of, of lock is that they would mar up my HRE FT1 wheels. Not if you happen to put some felt or something or between coat it. it with rubber or something. Ah, why not? Oh, I could dip it in a vat of that uh, rubberized dip stuff. Or, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, oh, plastic you put dip. on like the yeah, handles, handles of, of screwdrivers. Yeah, there you go. Interesting. I might be on board with that idea. Truck Show Podcast at gmail.com is the general email inbox. Lightning at truckshowpodcast.com is me. And Holman at truckshowpodcast.com is him. The Truck Show, The Truck Show, The Truck Show, oh, oh. And of course, you can follow us and do that over on the Gram at Truck Show Podcast or on Facebook. You can find our uh, individual profiles at LBC Lighting, at Sean P. Holman. And of course, we love hearing from you, whether you're wrenching in the garage, you're driving cross country, you're bored, you're happy, you have something to say, you uh, disagree with us. Well, hit us up on the five-star hotline, 657-205-6105. Are you sure that you want to open it up to people who disagree with us? We say that every time. I could be like a landslide. Bring it in. In fact, uh, Zach at Dana saw me in Moab and told me that some of the things that Mr. Stephen Watson said were incorrect. And he's like, I have a response. And so I said, bring it on. We got to have Zach from Dana on. What do we get him on with? Stephen Brawl? Yes. Oh, maybe. Interesting. Anyway, so he's like, oh, there's some incorrect info. I have a list. I'm like, well, send an email. Oh, we actually made a list? Yeah. So Zach Casey over at, uh, at Dana, we're waiting to hear uh, hear back from you. So they're all listening. That's the point, right? Okay. All right. Uh, head over to truckshowpodcast.com on our website. Not only can you find all the uh, new events that are happening in your world, but you can also find our feature products page. We'll be uh, updating that soon. And then also... Uh, leave us a review, either on Spotify or Apple Podcast app. Please leave us a five-star review. Those things help for the discoverability of the show. And uh, we, before we uh, hang it up, we have to thank our guest, Jim Pickering, if you're looking for how to uh, build and modify your Chevy GMC truck, your 67 to 72, or your 73 to 87. Uh, you want to check out his books that are available from CarTech. And uh, there will also be a discount code on our featured products page if you're interested in purchasing those particular books or any of the books in the CarTech catalog. Uh, hold on just a second, Holman. I am just ordering both books and used our discount. There you go. Done. Uh, did you go to the cartechbooks.com website and type in truck show before you uh, hit the purchase button? You know I did. 20% off. All right. Uh, before we close out the show, we have to thank our friends over at Nissan, the presenting sponsor of this and just about all truck show podcasts. We're excited to have them on board for another year so we can tell you all about the awesome Nissan pickup trucks like the Frontier. If you're in the market for a midsize truck, head over to your local Nissan dealer where you can check them out in person. Build and price your Nissan Frontier at NissanUSA.com. Get that 310 horsepower V6, that fully box frame. You can choose from two body styles. Get those zero gravity seats, that Fender audio system. And uh, hey, you know, I was looking up, even the Nissan Frontier Crew Cab Pro 4X, which is the heaviest version of it, still has 1,220 pounds of maximum payload and can still tow 6,170 pounds. Sounds like a deal to me. 
And speaking of smoking deals, if you got a 17 to 24 Duramax L5P and you're interested in the brand new Monster Ram, which improves throttle response, extends turbo life, and does so with no turbo surge, head over to at LBC Lightning on the gram and DM me for a little something something. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I'll a hook discount. a brother up. A discount. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Right. Well, I didn't want to say discount. All right. Because Banks doesn't do discounts. No. Well, but LBC Lightning does. But LBC can... LBC Lightning. You're selling stuff out of the back uh, of your trunk in an alley, right? I mean, a little bit. Or at the back door of the uh, warehouse? <laughs> no, 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 no. No, no, no. Hold on a second. No, no, no. That implies I'm stealing stuff. That, that's not the case. I'm just uh, you giving you- You steal the hearts and minds of our listeners every I, week. That's what I'm doing. I got a little- I got a super secret discount code. Oh, I said discount. I got a super secret listener bro code. Yeah, that's what I'm going to call it, the bro code. The bro code, all right. <laughs> all right, and uh, of course, uh, if you are looking for quality, full synthetic lubrication for your truck, you got to go see Amsoil. Head over to amsoil.com. Check out the catalog. They are a pioneer in synthetic lubricants. They have been for more than 50 years, whether it's motor oil, lubricants and protectants, grease, additives, and even more than that, Amsoil has you covered. They are the official oil and title sponsor of Ultimate Callout Challenge and the official oil of the National Association of Diesel Motorsports. Find out how Amsoil synthetic lubricants can save you money and time by helping your vehicles run better and last longer than with conventional oils at Amsoil.com. Amsoil is the leader in synthetics. Thanks for watching, and remember, everything matters. The Truck Show Podcast is a production of Truck Famous LLC. This podcast was created by Sean Holman and Jay Tillis with production elements by DJ Omar Khan. If you like what you've heard, please open your Apple Podcast or Spotify app and give us a five-star rating. And if you're a fan, there's no better way to show your support than by patronizing our sponsors. Some vehicles may have been harmed during the making of this podcast.